Senhoras e senhores, boa tarde. Solicitamos a todos que se acomodem, lembramos da importância de manterem seus aparelhos sonoros no modo silencioso. Em nome da diretoria da Agência Nacional de Energia Elétrica, ANEL, damos as boas-vindas a todos que nos honram com suas presenças e iniciamos as atividades do workshop Brasil-Alemanha sobre mini e micro geração, liberalização de mercado de energia elétrica e o papel do prosumidor. Agradecemos a todos pela presença. Para a abertura do evento, convidamos para compor a mesa o chefe de gabinete substituto Rodrigo Coelho. Convidamos ainda a coordenadora do Grupo de Estudo de Direito, Recursos Naturais e Sustentabilidade da Universidade de Brasília, a senhora Juliana Vilas Boas. Boa tarde a todos. Primeiro, eu cumprimento a minha amiga aqui, Juliana Vilas Lobos, Boas, coordenadora do Grupo de Estudo em Direito, Recursos Naturais e Sustentabilidade da UNB. Cumprimento também nosso procurador-geral da ANEL, Luiz Eduardo. Cumprimento nosso ex-diretor-geral, doutor Edivaldo. É um prazer estar com o senhor aqui. Também cumprimento o professor Christian Pilou, professor da Universidade Brohum e diretor do Instituto de Direito Minerário e de Energia. Muito bem-vindo. Professor Matias Lang, professor da Universidade de Berlim. Seja muito bem-vindo aqui à nossa casa. Cumprimento também todos os servidores e servidoras da ANEL. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos. Primeiro, eu peço licença para pedir desculpas pelo doutor, o diretor-geral, o doutor André, que estava a caminho para vir para cá, mas foi com convocado para uma reunião no Palácio, então teve que ir às pressas. Ele que já vem conversando com o Luiz Eduardo sobre o evento e, e a importância que tem esse evento e essa troca de experiências internacionais. Mas aqui eu vou fazer um breves palavras aqui representando o diretor-geral. Primeiro, expressar a nossa satisfação né, da presença aqui em nossa casa de catedráticos com currículos tão admiráveis, né, como os do professor Matias Lang e do professor Christian Pilou, e poder compartilhar essa experiência sobre a regulação do setor elétrico. Né. É, falar sobre liberalização, né, que ainda a gente tem um passo muito grande a avançar no sentido de liberalização, e também falar sobre geração distribuída, que é um assunto que está fervilhando aqui no nosso setor. Né. Então, queridos professores, queridos amigos da ANEL, Talvez não tenha momento mais apropriado para falar sobre transição energética, liberalização do setor de energia elétrica, do que esse que estamos vivendo hoje. A gente está em meio a uma discussão avançada sobre a modernização do setor elétrico. Hoje existe um GT de modernização coordenado pelo Ministério de Minas e Energia, onde a ANEL faz parte, convidada a participar das reuniões, né, que discute... É a transformação do setor elétrico, a modernização do setor elétrico, basicamente é fundada em quatro pilares. O primeiro pilar dessa modernização é o protagonismo, né, estudar e verificar como inserir dentro do setor elétrico aquilo que no mundo hoje já está muito é, estabelecido, que é o protagonismo do consumidor, né, ou seja, o consumidor como o agente principal do direito de escolha dentro do setor elétrico. Depois, um outro pilar importante é a inserção das novas tecnologias dentro da matriz. Então, a gente fala aqui da expansão, principalmente das fontes alternativas, das fontes renováveis, que já fazem, já tem uma, uma grande participação dentro da nossa matriz elétrica, mas com uma potencialidade de, de aumentar cada vez mais. Um terceiro pilar é a preocupação ou a sensibilidade ambiental dentro de todo esse contexto. E um quarto pilar que se estuda dentro da modernização do setor e que se coloca como pilar na regulação do setor elétrico hoje é a desoneração tarifária, ou mais do que isso, a, a, a avaliação 
dos preços compatíveis com a capacidade que o consumidor tem de pagar, que a gente chama de willingness to pay, né? ou seja, quanto que o consumidor tem capacidade de pagar por aquele preço. Então, dentro desses quatro pilares é que a gente vem discutindo as agendas do setor, as agendas da regulação, é, nessa reunião, a última reunião agora de ontem da, da RPO, foi é, apresentado à sociedade a nossa agenda regulatória, construída de uma forma diferente das agendas anteriores, ou seja, uma construção conjunta com a sociedade, né, e que agora a gente já tem no dia 14 aí, uma audiência pública para colocar em discussão esses pontos, e basicamente dentro da agenda em cima desses quatro pilares, a gente tem, vem discutindo vários pontos, como tarifa binômia, a própria geração distribuída, que é o que a gente está discutindo agora com a, com a revisão da 482, a operação e a contabilização diária ou intradiária, que é muito importante para a gente conseguir criar mecanismos para liberalizar o setor. Né, isso é algo que está ainda num passo de criança dentro do setor elétrico, a gente precisa avançar muito nesse sentido e perpassa obviamente dentro dessa questão da abertura de mercado, né, da abertura do mercado livre e também da operação e da contabilização e liquidação diária ou intradiária. Também se discute dentro da nossa agenda como visão de futuro a mobilidade elétrica, leilão de eficiência energética e a capacidade de resposta à demanda e novas formas de armazenamento, entre outras tantas regulações que aqui os senhores né, das áreas técnicas estão acompanhando de perto. Então, nesse momento de quebra de paradigma, de pensar fora da zona de conforto e atuar além das nossas rotinas do dia a dia, e que não são fáceis e que são poucas, né, que compartilhar experiências internacionais é muito oportuno e me parece, parece para a ANEL um caminho muito adequado. Né, convidar, e aí eu louvo a iniciativa do nosso Procurador-Geral de trazer esses catedráticos né, para nos auxiliar no sentido de pensar fora da caixinha. A gente aqui na ANEL tem crescido muito com essas experiências internacionais. Né? Hoje a ANEL preside uma associação de reguladores ibero-americanos, onde compartilha experiências com países né, da América Latina, e Portugal e Espanha. Além de hoje, agora, presidir também a, a associação de reguladores de língua portuguesa, RELOP, então, isso tudo traz para a gente um ganho muito grande, porque apesar das particularidades de cada país, né, a gente pode discutir, os desafios são muito comuns. Né? Então, tanto desafios nesses países ibero-americanos, como países europeus, leste europeu, países asiáticos, é sempre muito importante a gente compartilhar dessas experiências e adaptar, obviamente, a nossa particularidade. Então, eu termino agradecendo mais uma vez a presença dos nossos ilustres catedráticos aqui, e desejo a todos uma tarde, uma tarde de profícuos debates, sempre pensando que essas experiências internacionais vão nos servir cada vez mais para cumprir a nossa missão, que é nada mais do que desenvolver o né, um mercado de energia elétrica em equilíbrio entre os agentes e em benefício da sociedade. Eu desejo a todos uma ótima tarde, que a gente possa crescer muito com, esses, com esse conhecimento dos professores. Muito obrigado. Nós agradecemos o pronunciamento de abertura do chefe de gabinete substituto da NEL, Rodrigo Coelho, e convidamos para fazer o uso da palavra a coordenadora Juliana Vilas Boas. Boa tarde a todos. Cumprimento inicialmente o senhor diretor-geral André Peptoni, aqui representado pelo senhor chefe de gabinete, doutor Rodrigo Coelho, senhor procurador-geral Luiz Eduardo, Estimados professores, eh, Matias Lang e Christian Pilov, servidores, estudantes, convidados e demais presentes. Em nome do professor Márcio Iori, diretor executivo do Núcleo de Direito Setorial e Regulatório da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília, gostaríamos de agradecer imensamente o convite para compor esta mesa. Infelizmente, o professor não pôde participar deste evento em razão de um choque de agenda. Por essa razão, coube a mim e ao Miller Mesquita, meu colega, a quem agradeço muito uh, todo o companheirismo nesse trabalho, na condição de coordenadores executivos do Grupo de Estudos em Direito de Energia Elétrica vinculado à Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília, dar as boas-vindas aos professores Mas Matias Lang e Christian Pilot. Para o Núcleo de Direito Setorial e Regulatório da Universidade de Brasília, e especialmente para o Grupo de Estudos em Direito de Energia Elétrica, 
Este evento é um importante passo para a concretização de uma possível cooperação acadêmica da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília com notáveis universidades da Alemanha. Criado em 2001, o Núcleo tem contribuído para o desenvolvimento do Estado da Arte em Direito Setorial e Regulatório, ao congregar em ambiente colaborativo, formuladores de políticas públicas, reguladores, usuários consumidores e a sociedade civil, consolidando o diálogo interdisciplinar para enfrentamento das transformações dos mais diversos setores regulados. Por sua vez, o Grupo de Estudos em Direito de Energia Elétrica, que é integrado ao Núcleo, atua sob a coordenação acadêmica do vice-diretor da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília, professor doutor Otton de Azevedo Lopes, dialogando com a linha de pesquisa da pós-graduação da Universidade, denominada Transformações da Ordem Social e Econômica da Regulação. Assim, o grupo se propõe a refletir sobre a prática regulatória do setor elétrico no Brasil e no mundo, a partir do estudo de teorias jurídicas, arcabouços normativos e políticas públicas, considerando as perspectivas técnicas, regulatória e econômica. Nesse contexto, o presente workshop sobre mini e microgeração conversa diretamente com os temas de pesquisa que o grupo vem se dedicando, a exemplo da abertura do mercado brasileiro de energia, do impacto das tecnologias disruptivas na regulação do mercado de energia elétrica, da implementação das políticas de redução de carbono nas diferentes economias mundiais e da transição energética, com foco no desenvolvimento de tecnologias e fontes de energia limpa, capazes de atender de forma sustentável e eficiente às necessidades globais. Com essas breves palavras, certos de que seremos brindados com brilhantes exposições nessa tarde, gostaríamos uma vez mais de agradecer o convite feito pela ANEL, nas pessoas do diretor-geral, aqui representado pelo Dr. Rodrigo Coelho, e também ao amigo e procurador-geral da ANEL, Dr. Luiz Eduardo, e reforçar o convite à cooperação acadêmica entre a Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília e as universidades da Alemanha, em especial as universidades de Bochum e München, aqui representadas pelos professores Matias Lang e Christian Pilov. Muito obrigada e um bom evento a todos. Neste momento, a mesa de abertura se desfaz. Nós convidamos o senhor Rodrigo Coelho e a senhora Juliana Vilas Boas a tomarem assento no auditório. Convidamos, neste momento para ministrar a palestra Liberalização do Setor Elétrico Europeu e o Fortalecimento do Papel do Consumidor, o professor da Universidade de Bocum e diretor do Instituto de Direito Minerário e de Energia, o senhor Christian Pilov. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you very much <coughs> for the kind uh, uh, introduction to this uh, workshop, ladies and uh, uh, gentlemen. Buon dia, buenos dias, guten Tag uh, <laughs> from uh, Germany. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to be here you together with my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Dr. Lang. And uh, yeah, this this kind of uh, meetings, this kind of workshops, uh, give us uh, often. Uh, we are very glad about this uh, opportunity to 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 broaden up, to open our horizons, in order to debate uh, on different uh, uh, energy, especially electricity market uh, designs. And so far, uh, uh, it was already mentioned. Uh, the dialogue uh, among uh, uh, Portuguese-speaking uh, countries about uh, energy market uh, regulation, uh, uh, dialogue uh, within the Americas, uh, and now we would like to introduce, uh, uh, if you like, uh, some 
some uh, special views uh, from, from Germany and in particular also from the Euro uh, uh, European uh, Union. The law and the policy of the U European Union uh, will be the subject uh, of my um, conference, of my lecture uh, now, especially um, having regard to, to the uh, strengthening of the role of consumers and also uh, prosumers in uh, this uh, context. But let me first um, just uh, introduce uh, myself uh, to give you an impression from where we are and uh, what we are uh, doing. You see here some, some uh, satellite photo from the European uh, uh, continent uh, with three big, the three biggest uh, big lights the three uh, biggest agglomerations uh, that we have in, in Europe. You all uh, know the, the region of Paris, you know the region of London in the UK, and the third one at the, <coughs> at the right, that is the valley of the Ruhr, the, uh, uh, the valley of the Rio, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the river Ruhr. The river um, Ruhr uh, region is uh, famous uh, since uh, decades uh, for his uh, industry uh, history, especially in coal and steel. Mm? Uh, the region is, is, uh, uh, has have been ubiquitous uh, um, over the nearly 100 uh, uh, years and more, uh, the, the um, um, heavy industry of Germany, which uh, served also, one has to say that, as a uh, arm, uh, 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 as a center for, for arm, uh, arms uh, production during the Second uh, World War. And then, after the breakdown, uh, after the Second uh, World War, um, um, this uh, region, the Ruhr Valley, uh, served, uh, um, served in, in some kind uh, to start the process um, of the European uh, integration. We will see it uh, later on. Uh, one, one key uh, subject uh, at this, uh, um, at this uh, time of my uh, lecture uh, it, the, the problem uh, was to integrate uh, the steel companies, uh, the steel industry, steel and coal um, uh, industry uh, into, the, uh, into a European dialogue uh, to integr uh, integrate uh, uh, with, with the aim, with the obj objective to make peace all over Europe. After the Second uh, World War, it was uh, the biggest interest uh, of the founding uh, parties, of the founding states of the European Union, uh, to, to, to guarantee uh, peace all over Re Europe. And the first step in order to, to uh, develop a, a peacemaking surrounding, a peacemaking fra policy framework in uh, Europe was to integrate uh, the steel and coal uh, um, uh, industry, which in former times uh, served as uh, for, for arm, uh, arms uh, uh, production uh, into a European concert. Nowadays, uh, steel and company um, doesn't do not uh, play uh, such a big uh, uh, role like in former times. Uh, the last uh, mining, uh, the last uh, hard coal mine in our region in the in the in the 1950s, they were still working about uh, 60 or 70 or even more uh, hard coal mines uh, in that region. Uh, the last uh, hard coal mine uh, of all hard coal mine had been uh, shut down. Uh, um, at the end of the last uh, year, December 2018, uh, which was also due to the European law uh, because uh, of the um, um, uh, disparity of uh, coal subsidies. Coal sub uh, subsidies w uh, was uh, were against the, the, the framework of the European law and w uh, because it was uh, uh, prohibited. Uh, uh, our mines had uh, to, to be closed because they uh, could work in the last years only by means of uh, public uh, subsidies. Uh, the, the, the mining in Germany is uh, very ex expensive. Uh, the, the hard coal is very deep in the uh, earth, and therefore, uh, therefore it was not uh, competitive with the hard coal from other uh, and third uh, countries. It was subsidized, and this sub subsidized um, had, been, had to be um, uh, um, finished uh, due to the European law. Uh, and, uh, um, and so far, the whole region um, is in the course of the uh, restructuring uh, process. Not mo no, no more um, coal mines. There are still uh, very important steel companies in, in the region. But on the other side, uh, we change uh, the region from, from, the, from the original 
coal mining region into a scientific uh, uh, community region. A new university were founded uh, inter alia, our own university where I am uh, working, you see the, the, the photo at the, uh, at the right. The Ruhr University was uh, f uh, founded some uh, 50 years uh, ago, and uh, nowadays uh, there are ma many, many, many uh, students in the region, other universities that were, were founded, and, and uh, so on. Well, let's start um, with, with uh, our uh, subject I have to, um, and uh, the following uh, agenda. First of all, I would like to give you a, sh a very short introduction to the main uh, principles um, of the uh, European law, especially of the European energy law, um, in order to give you an understanding for uh, how it's working uh, and, and how, how we have, uh, how, it's, yeah, how it's working is the relationship of the European law and policy on the one side and uh, the national law, the domestic law of the member states, 20 up, up, up to now uh, 28 member states uh, on the other hand. Second uh, step, uh, I will tell you something about the um, um, chronology of the development of the European energy uh, policy, especially regarding the topic of liberalization of the electricity market, and at the same time also the markets for natural gas has been uh, opened, had been uh, liberalized in the last uh, years. Then I will deal with the recent and uh, uh, s s somewhat uh, new, the recent uh, um, uh, legislative uh, package that most recently uh, came into force, legislative uh, package called Clean Energy for All Europeans. And in particular, uh, I would like to give you some uh, ideas and some impressions, especially uh, on the role of uh, consumers, uh, or if you like, of the uh, role of prosumers, consumers of electricity who at the same time produce their uh, own uh, energy by means of mini generation um, installations or, or micro uh, generation uh, facilities. Okay, if you like, uh, at the end we can uh, uh, start our debate and discussion uh, about the out outlook, outlook, what are the uh, what is the future of the European uh, energy liberalization scheme inter alia um, uh, with view to the problem of uh, security of electricity supply. Um, on the other hand, I, I have to apologize uh, for, for my uh, relatively bad uh, English. I would very, uh, very like to s uh, more like to speak to you in Portuguese. I cannot speak uh, Portuguese. I have some some relation to the, uh, the Portuguese uh, country because of very broad uh, familiar relationships in Galicia, and uh, I, I know uh, Gal the Galician uh, uh, language. As, uh, as you know, Galician uh, Galician very very. Uh, neighbored with the Portuguese, uh, uh, um, with the Portuguese uh, language, but uh, I would, uh, very I would uh, prefer to speak to, to you in English for the same, uh, in not, not in English, in Spanish for, for the same uh, reason, and uh, if, if we perhaps in the discussion we can also follow up um, uh, in Spanish. Now I mentioned this, uh, my, my Spanish uh, activities because I'm uh, developing since many years uh, already uh, some cooperation um, uh, with universities in Latin uh, in Spain uh, and also in Latin uh, America. I've been uh, giving lectures in the universities in, in Bogota, in, in, in uh, um, Buenos Aires, in, in Mexico, and, and so on. And so far, I'm uh, always open uh, for further dialogues with uh, experts, especially in Latin uh, America, and uh, with our Institute of, of um, energy and mining law in Bochum. We also already um, developed also a broad uh, cooperation project, investigation research uh, project um, some years ago with the University of Campinas uh, about uh, the questions of uh, energy uh, efficiency, development of a framework, political and legal uh, framework for the promotion of energy uh, efficiency. Well. Let's start um, with the uh, European law and uh, policy. As you may uh, see here, the, from the very beginning of the European integration, uh, uh, 1957, this was uh, the year of the so-called Treaties of Rome, the, the main pillars 
uh, contractual uh, uh, treaty p uh, pillars of the Euro European integration. We started with only six uh, member states and uh, the European Union uh, grew up, up to uh, nowadays uh, 28 uh, member states. Uh, one of our member states will perhaps uh, 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 give up the, the, the friendship with the European Union. We, uh, we are dealing uh, since many times with the Brexit. Uh, but uh, I, I did not want to speak about the Brexit, uh, but uh, give you the impression about the, about the, how it's working. about the extension, the possible uh, extension of the European Union in the future. There are uh, some neighboring countries such like Norway, uh, the Uk Ukraine and also t uh, Turkey which are on the path perhaps in the, in the next uh, uh, following uh, years to, to enter uh, the European Union. Uh, as you probably will know, there, there are very, uh, very controversial uh, debates uh, about uh, these uh, questions. But if, if you regard uh, these uh, countries, uh, you must see that all the countries uh, that possibly uh, will have an uh, entrance to the European Union are very important countries uh, under the aspect of energy policy. Norway has gas and oil. Uh, the Ukraine is uh, important for the uh, transit of Russian gas uh, to the European Union. And uh, Turkey is also an, an important uh, transit uh, country, per perhaps in the future, uh, for the transit of uh, natural gas uh, from, from, the, from the Asian uh, gas fields outside of uh, Russia. And so far, you can see that uh, energy uh, policy, since ever, played, uh, played a very important role for the integration of, of the European Union. And that you can th this important role of energy policy um, can be regarded al already with the beginning of the European uh, uh, treaties uh, law. The first European community was the, as already mentioned, uh, uh, in the context with our region, uh, the Ruhr Valley in Germany, um, the first uh, European community which, which was fo founded in the early 1950s of the late, late uh, last uh, century was uh, the community on um, the European, co European community of coal uh, and steel. Uh, as already mentioned, the um, main idea of this uh, community was uh, to create a framework for making peace, for, for securing uh, peace all over Europe by integrating uh, of, heavy s uh, of heavy industries, heavy industries in, in form of steel and coal um, industries. Uh, this was uh, the first uh, step, and, and so far you, you, you can imagine that energy uh, played all co coal energy, especially in particular, played a uh, significant role when it came to the uh, first steps of European uh, integration. The first uh, community, European community on coal and steel, was followed by two other uh, communities in the later 1950s. Uh, I already mentioned the treaties of Rome, and you, have you probably have heard uh, about, uh, on the one side, the European Atomic Energy Community, again, uh, energy policy as, no, as a significant uh, pillar of European, um, Eu European integration, now uh, focusing on, on nuclear uh, power and the use of uh, uh, nuclear uh, power plants. I will not go into uh, details of, of this uh, community. Um, a little uh, much more important for our subject uh, today um, is the second uh, treaty of Rome, which was in the beginning the European, the treaty uh, on the European ec Economic uh, Community. European Economic uh, Community, EEC, uh, why it is uh, until uh, today is very important uh, because this uh, treaty, EEC, is dealing with all uh, kinds of um, industry and, and uh, economic activities uh, all over Europe. It's not limited to only one branch of, of uh, industry like steel and coal or nuclear power. It concerns all, uh, um, um, all uh, economic and industrial um, um, activities in order, in order to build up step by step the so-called internal market. Internal uh, market is one of the most important uh, principles of this uh, treaty. Means uh, the free flow, the free um, uh, traffic 
of uh, merchant uh, uh, of uh, uh, yeah uh, of goods of services of of uh, um, persons and of capital among the uh, over cross border uh, uh, among the uh, member states of the European Union and so far the EEC treaty is the most uh, um, uh, under under uh, legal view the EEC treaty is the most important uh, treaty in our uh, context in the early beginning of the European Union um, the European uh, Union um, uh, developed already um, first and early steps of um, uh, energy policy, especially in the context of the um, uh, so-called oil crisis, oil crisis in the early 1970s, when the OPEC um, uh, stopped to deliver uh, gas and oil to the European uh, countries and the, the, the prices were, were uh, increasing. Then um, the, the energy um, policy of the European Union, uh, of the European Community in those days uh, was uh, started inter alia by uh, um, building up the so-called uh, IEA, the, the International uh, Energy Agency, and uh, uh, provisions about the stockage, uh, 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 emergency uh, stockage of um, of uh, gas, especially. Uh, from from the OPEC uh, country and so on, but uh, these were uh, only uh, f first uh, steps. Um, as to the other main principles, I uh, already mentioned the main principle of the internal market, creating an internal market. Um, you should uh, bear in mind the following following principles. There are much more principles of the European U Union, but these are uh, most important to my view in order to understand the re relationship between uh, European law and, and national law. On the first hand, uh, the principle of uh, supremacy uh, of uh, European law over domestic law. European law um, is, is uh, much more important uh, uh, than domestic law in the m uh, member state, which, which would uh, say that uh, uh, when there is a legislation of member states uh, which uh, uh, is against of uh, European law, uh, yeah, they, they enters into force the, the principle of uh, supremacy, and uh, so far uh, you you see uh, the importance of the European uh, European law, which differs uh, um, a lot. From from the law, of, uh, for for instance, uh, here in Latin uh, America, the law of the uh, Mercos, uh, Mercosur uh, is not so important uh, in the practice uh, like it is in the case of the European uh, law. The further principle is the principle of direct uh, applicability um, of the uh, treaty law and uh, of the secondary law. The treaty law is the primary law of the uh, European Union. Uh, as already mentioned, the three uh, uh, founding uh, treaties, and on, on the other hand, um, the, um, the secondary law, which is uh, which means uh, the law which was which is made by the uh, European legislator, the uh, legislator uh, in Brussels and in Strasbourg, uh, where, where the uh, Euro European Parliament uh, is uh, located. Uh, the European le uh, legislator approves uh, so-called directives and uh, regulations. And especially regulations and other uh, other provisions of the treaties are of direct applicability. They they need no uh, transformation into national or domestic law. They can uh, directly be be uh, uh, applicated uh, among the citizens and and market uh, actors in the member states. And last but not least, uh, the principle of conferral. Uh, the principle of uh, conferral means. That the European Union, on the one side, uh, can act and approve uh, own European uh, laws and uh, directives and uh, regulations, but uh, the European uh, Union is uh, only allowed uh, to 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 uh, approve these uh, acts in the framework of competences which before before have have uh, have been transferred from the main member states uh, to the to the European Euro, Euro, European le level. In other words, uh, only acting o only uh, legislation uh, of the European Union uh, when there are specific competences. The uh, European Union has no, as we say in Germany, competence competence. Uh, uh, it's not a sovereign uh, body like, like a national state. Uh, um, she can 
the union can also o only act uh, in the framework of uh, this uh, sp specific uh, competences. And from these uh, principles, uh, we can uh, uh, con uh, conclude very simply and clearly uh, that the music of economic uh, policy and law uh, plays in Brussels. In Brussels, uh, um, the, the national legislator um, uh, are following up with their own legislation in, in the field of uh, ec uh, economic uh, law, but the music uh, plays in, in, in Brussels, uh, especially um, um, uh, due to the principle of uh, supremacy of the European law over the domestic uh, law. And this is also the case in the, uh, in the field of energy uh, policy and en energy law at the European level. Well, I, I said to you that uh, the European integration uh, process began uh, to some extent uh, with, with, uh, with uh, energy uh, due to the uh, important role in the uh, steel and coal uh, sector, but on, on the other side, the most important treaty of the, um, of the integration, I uh, told it, uh, it, it is uh, the EEC tre treaty, the treaty on the uh, European uh, Economic uh, Community, did not mention en energy with, ener uh, with any word. No, uh, no mention of, of uh, energy in the first uh, and most uh, important treaty of the, of the Union. And there we have, uh, we have to <laughs> see uh, clearly that energy policy was regarded of the founding states of the European uh, Union as a sort of own and uh, sovereign um, policy of, of, the, of the states, of the member states, not of the European Union, but of the states. Uh, and this was uh, due, there was a kind of jealousy uh, among the member states with the European uh, community. Um, this was uh, due especially to many different um, policy, uh, policy um, uh, permissions in, in the in the member st states. Uh, you, you know perhaps that that uh, the energy policy and the structure of energy industry is differing from one country to another. For instance, we have France with a share of uh, up to 80 percent of nuclear power in the in the electricity production. On the other side, there's Germany with this uh, phasing out uh, of uh, of the use of uh, nuclear. Uh, power. We have Poland with a big interest uh, still up to today uh, in coal-fired uh, uh, power plants, uh, etc., etc. The, the organization of the industries in the member states are, are al also very different. Uh, you have the, uh, you have mainly in, in France, you have mainly public-owned uh, uh, companies. On the one hand, few and, and national on the national le level acting uh, public-owned uh, companies. And in Germany, uh, you have uh, something about 1,000 uh, electricity uh, companies on, on different uh, level, especially on, on the local level, the, the very, very important, the local uh, entities, so-called uh, Stadtwerke acting in, in the uh, sector. And therefore, from this uh, big uh, differences uh, in the, in the, in the um, energy sector, you can uh, conclude uh, that wa there was a, a, a huge resistance from the beginning uh, from the beginning, from the side of, um, of uh, energy uh, of member countries um, against an uh, own uh, policy, um, energy policy of the European Union. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, the European Union started their uh, own energy policy. Uh, on the basis, there was no uh, specific clause on, on energy policy competence in the, sec uh, in, in the treaties, but the, as already mentioned, there were general, um, general rules uh, which concerned uh, any kind of uh, uh, industrial sector, and so far on the basis of these uh, general rules, the European Commission started very early uh, to develop uh, uh, against the resistance of the member states and own, uh, and own um, um, energy policies, step by step. And then uh, the last uh, treaty which uh, changed the former uh, um, international law related uh, framework of the uh, European integration, the last tre uh, treaty came into force. This was the Treaty of Lisbon, concluded uh, in 2007 in the Portuguese, in, uh, in the capital of uh, Portugal, and then it, it entered into uh, force after a large process of transformation in the member states, 
the Treaty of Lisbon uh, entered into force in its December of uh, 2009. And only since then, only since uh, December 2009, we have an own, nowadays we have an own uh, a chapter on energy policy, on European energy so, uh, policy in, in the treaty. And uh, this chapter, ch chapter only contains one, uh, uh, one uh, article. This is the article 194. You find here in this slide uh, the wording of this article 194. Uh, first of all, in the first uh, paragraph, uh, they are laid down the uh, objectives of the, of the um, union's uh, policy in the energy sector. Objectives uh, with, with are uh, ensuring the functioning of the energy market, first of all, internal market, uh, then ensuring the security of energy supply in the union, which has uh, since ever been uh, a, big, uh, um, a big matter of, of uh, European policy in the sector, and then promoting energy efficiency and energy saving and the development of new and renewable forms of energy, and last but not least, uh, promoting the interconnection of um, uh, energy networks. I will come back uh, to these uh, principles later on. But the most important, uh, what I like to uh, show you, is um, here the competence clause. On the one hand, uh, the competence uh, clause um, appears, uh, appears uh, somewhat broad uh, when it says uh, the following, without a prejudice uh, to the application of other provisions of the treaties, the European Parliament and the Council, acting in accordance with the ordinary legislative procedure, shall establish the measures, the measures necessary to achieve the objectives in uh, paragraph one. No? Uh, there's a, um, a relatively broad uh, competence clause no, now introduced by the, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon, but uh, here in red, uh, there's a reserve cl clause uh, in favor of the member states, in fav favor of our own um, uh, energy policy within the member states, uh, which says the follow, uh, following, such measures shall not affect a mem uh, measures of the European Union, shall not, not affect a member state's right to determine the conditions for exploiting its energy resources, its choice between different energy sources, and the general structure of its energy supply, uh, yeah, and, and uh, so on. You can see we are here before, before the phenomenon uh, of uh, only shared uh, competence, shared uh, policy and legislative uh, competence between the European Union on the one side and the member states on the other side. And this, this is the reason uh, for what uh, until uh, today uh, the development of, of an own uh, European energy policy is uh, some, uh, some, uh, something uh, difficult. Well, let us now uh, have a view to the development of the, um, uh, of spe specifically and in particular to the um, de development of liberalization of the uh, electricity sector. As you can easily imagine, uh, liberalization of the energy, uh, energy sector was not so, so uh, was, was a, a huge uh, task and hu huge uh, uh, objective due to the fact that uh, in all member countries at the beginning, uh, monopolies and uh, ol 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 uh, oligopoles were existing. Uh, no, not uh, any uh, steps of, of uh, um, liberalization within the countries. The wave of liber liberalization came to the European, European uh, sector with the uh, policy in the UK in the United uh, kin Kingdom in the, in the times of uh, Maggie Thatcher. The, the President Ma uh, Maggie Thatcher in his uh, times uh, uh, realized uh, a policy of liberalization in all uh, sectors, transport sector, coal sector, energy industry, postal uh, sector, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, therefore, this was, was, um, yeah, this was a model for the European legislator in order successively, only step by step, with uh, uh, step one step af after another, the, the opening of uh, natural gas and electricity markets uh, all over Europe. The started the process uh, started in the early 1990s, 1990s of, of the uh, uh, last uh, 
uh, century with uh, first uh, directives uh, which only dealt with the transit of natural gas and of uh, electricity through the uh, um, member states. And on the uh, second level, uh, on the, as a second uh, step, there were a first uh, directive on the tra tra transparency of in industrial consumer prices for gas and electricity. The, the uh, proper um, liberalization uh, in a, in a, in a, in a never was a sense started then uh, in 1996 and 1998, uh, eight, uh, excuse me, with the entering into force of the directives for the internal market for electricity and the internal market of uh, natural gas, which were the main, which were, were the main pillars of this uh, first liberalization uh, measures. Uh, first uh, main instrument, uh, separation or in other words, unbundling of organization uh, and uh, accounting of networks. Uh, unbundling of the network uh, operation from the in former times vertically integrated um, uh, energy under undertakings in uh, order to let them work, so the network uh, operators, only as, as uh, transporters of uh, gas, and, uh, um, gas and electricity and independently uh, of the interests of the former uh, undertaking. But in the first steps, uh, this, this concerned only uh, the, the unbundling, the separation of organization uh, among uh, uh, one and the same um, um, undertaking, um, the separation of organization, network on the one side, and other uh, 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 generation and, and, and retail and, and wholesale, uh, et cetera, on the other uh, side, uh, and uh, the separation, of course, of uh, counting of networks. First step. Set, second um, instrument, third party access. Um, the, uh, according to the directives, the member state states had to act uh, own laws in, in order to give the right to third party access to the competitors uh, in the market who can, uh, um, ha will have uh, access and you, you all uh, 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 will, will know easily that uh, nobody, uh, no uh, network operator uh, is voluntarily, uh, 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 will uh, voluntarily agree with a third party access and therefore the conditions, uh, how this will work, the third party uh, access uh, should be regulated by public uh, regulators. Public uh, regulators uh, exist, existed in most part of the countries, with one exception in Germany. There was uh, no tra tra uh, tradition of uh, public regulation of uh, networks. And so far, uh, uh, in the first uh, energy package, uh, there was still an exemption for G uh, Germany. Germany could make use uh, of, of, the, of the model, of the al alternative model of only negotiated Party, uh, party access negotiated between, between the parties, network operator on the one hand, and uh, deliverer, uh, um, uh, energy, uh, electricity and gas purchasing on the other hand, uh, without any kind of, uh, at that time, still without any uh, type of uh, energy regulation. Well, and, and the uh, uh, further restriction of this uh, first uh, package uh, was uh, that the market was opened only for big uh, customers. Only for big, and this would say for industrial uh, uh, customers, no word at this uh, uh, time uh, for, for uh, in, in order to open the market up for all, and all especially for, for small and household uh, cons consumers. Uh, this uh, panorama changed uh, with the second liber liberalization uh, package and legislation uh, package which was uh, elaborated uh, in the year 2003, uh, when the European uh, legislators saw that the first uh, um, um, package uh, would, would not help to open uh, uh, up enough the, uh, the market. This uh, second and so-called acceleration uh, package uh, was uh, approved. Uh, again, with a new directive on the in internal market of electricity uh, and an internal market directive on internal market of natural uh, gas. There were, uh, there were uh, also uh, some, some further, further uh, provisions, regulations, for, for, instance, for instance, on the conditions for the grid access for cross-border electricity uh, uh, trading 
And the objective of this uh, second legislative uh, um, package was to open, to fully open, to completely open um, the markets uh, for competition, also for, for household uh, customers and consumers until July 2007. Now we are in, in 2019 and we have to, to see that uh, until now, um, the, um, uh, the opening of, of uh, for competition for all um, um, uh, customers does not work in so far uh, as the interchange of uh, electricity and natural gas between the member states is uh, until now, uh, up, to, up, to, uh, up to today, uh, still restricted to only uh, somewhat about 10%. Only 10% of the whole uh, uh, electricity uh, and gas uh, uh, all over the European Union uh, is purchased um, uh, cost by, by means of uh, cross-border tracing among the member states. Whereas on the other side, you can you, you can say that within on the national level, within the uh, uh, 28 uh, member countries, uh, the liberalisation uh, scheme uh, works. There is really um, a competition for all for all consumers and customers, uh, each of us uh, can choo uh, choose his, um, his uh, energy uh, company or uh, gas in de uh, deliverer, and uh, this, uh, this is, of course, a result of this uh, second and ac acceleration uh, package. And also, since uh, 2003, uh, there's an obligation for all member states uh, to regulate the network access, the th third party um, access, um, by means of uh, public uh, authorities. No more negotiated uh, third party access, like in the first uh, legislative uh, uh, package, but now regulation of uh, network access uh, in all countries by regulatory uh, bodies. Let me sta start up uh, with, with the third and um, uh, even more strength strengthening uh, legislative uh, package. You see, step by step, we could not open up to the markets from the beginning. We, we, sh uh, we, could, we should um, we, uh, had to develop uh, things uh, only uh, step by step. The third step was the third legislative package uh, then of September and two f 2009. Uh, there were int uh, introduced new and, and uh, further strengthening instruments in, uh, in order to, to, to move up uh, the, um, uh, the, the competition in, uh, in the matrix. The unbundling scheme was strength strengthened uh, into an uh, unbundling, uh, um, unbundling uh, um, yeah, the, 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 the TSO, the transport system operators, was obliged now to uh, unbundle themselves uh, by means of ownership un unbundling. That means no, not not only organizational uh, organizational unbundling within the st same uh, undertaking. But uh, it was uh, strengthened up to an ownership uh, unbundling. In other words, for instance, the operators of uh, high-tension uh, electricity grids had to sell their grids to other uh, investors. They could not uh, uh, stay longer in the former uh, vertically integrated uh, uh, energy uh, undertaking. Other key instrument, uh, 10 years network development uh, planning. Um, I will show you later on the, the, the map of the uh, European, European um, uh, high tension grid uh, uh, connections and so far it's very, it's very important uh, to have a European plan about the extension and, and the build up of new uh, power lines in order to facilitate uh, and to, to promote uh, the trade of uh, electricity between our uh, countries. And there has been introduced also an own European, European uh, regulatory agency on the European level, which is called ASA, a Agency for the Cooperation of Energy uh, Regulators. And uh, yeah, f further uh, ins uh, instruments that uh, will not, will not, uh, should not interest uh, too much uh, for us. Uh, perhaps one word also uh, in, in uh, relation with the network development planning on the European uh, level, they entered into uh, force also in, uh, uh, in the year 2013 an own regulation on so-called trans-European energy uh, infrastructure regulation, which uh, obliges uh, the member state uh, to accelerate uh, planning and authorization uh, procedures 
in order to, to build up the so-called interconnectors, electri electricity and gas inter uh, interconnectors in the borders uh, between the uh, different uh, European uh, states in order uh, to, to make it easier uh, yeah, to, to purchase uh, electricity and, and uh, gas to other uh, countries. And here you, have, uh, you, you can have an uh, impression of the already very compound uh, and, and interconnected uh, electricity high uh, tension grid all over Europe. You uh, have to be in mind, this, this uh, connection uh, exists uh, since ever, uh, already uh, in times before of the liberalization. Uh, 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 there, there existed already um, extension of uh, connections between in the, co uh, in the high tension uh, grid, but it was not enough. Uh, the grid uh, connections among the countries had to be strengthened, had to be uh, extended. For instance, uh, the, uh, the peninsula, the Iberian pen pen Peninsula, was also in terms of uh, electricity and gas uh, perch of an insula. Uh, there were no, no co connections uh, uh, between France and, and uh, Spain nowadays, and uh, due to the already mentioned um, legislation uh, of, uh, of the European legislator, uh, there had to be built up uh, first high tension um, uh, connections between sp uh, Spain and uh, um, France uh, through the P uh, Pyrenees, and uh, we, we, have, we, we have to follow up to, to, ex uh, to extend these uh, connections uh, in order to, to make a really workable, workable the program, the political pro program of cross-border uh, trading. Well, <coughs> um, then uh, after this um, deliberations of the, of the development, historic uh, development of the market liberalization, I would now like to give you some ideas about the last and, and recent and newest uh, legislative uh, package, which uh, was uh, called also, also the so-called so winter package. <laughs> winter package because the draft uh, legislative uh, acts were, uh, have, have been presented uh, to, to the public in uh, winter in December of uh, 2016. And uh, it uh, took nearly uh, two years in, uh, in order to, to uh, promote uh, this uh, draft uh, pro uh, um, uh, project and, and uh, now the, um, the last legislative uh, package entered uh, into force. This is called um, legislated uh, package uh, with the title Clean Energy for All Europeans. And in order to, to, to let you understand what is really new in this package, uh, it's, it would be um, important to give you some, some uh, information about the uh, political objectives which are behind uh, this uh, legislative uh, package. The political uh, uh, objectives are uh, clearly um, uh, designed uh, by the uh, tr Treaty of uh, Paris, by the, by the Climate uh, Change uh, Agreement of Paris in, in December uh, 2015, uh, to such an extent that, that uh, also the European Union has signed uh, the, the Pari Paris uh, Protocol, in former times it already uh, signed the, the Kyoto uh, Protocol, but as a member now of the uh, participating uh, parties of the uh, Paris Protocol, uh, the European Union obliged herself in the same way like, like, like it did the member states, but the European Un uh, Union obliged herself to reduce uh, climate uh, um, uh, emissions uh, uh, up to 95% until uh, until uh, his failing the <laughs> most important information, of course, not uh, until 1990, 95% uh, perc reduction of uh, climate uh, emissions until the, the year 2050, and in relation uh, to the to the year of two, uh, uh, of uh, 1990. Uh, decarbonization is the leading political principle now uh, also of the energy policy of the European. Uh, union and therefore uh, the commission uh, prepared a so-called energy ro roadmap for two 2050 with further uh, goals concerning reducing re reducing of, of co2 uh, emissions and, and reducing of other greenhouse uh, emissions um, increasing of energy uh, efficiency 
um, and uh, of course uh, promoting of uh, re renewable energies. The, these are the political and, and climate, clearly climate uh, protection and climate change orient, uh, uh, leaded um, political goals behind the new legislative uh, package. And the new legislative uh, package was, f was uh, furthermore developed uh, under, an, under a new title of uh, European policy. Nowadays, the European uh, 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 Commission speaks uh, in words of the European uh, Energy Union. Uh, so, so she wants uh, to, to build up an own and uh, proper uh, energy uh, union in, 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 uh, instead of, of former uh, only se several steps. Now it's, uh, it sh uh, shall be an integrated and, and uh, uh, all embracing uh, um, the sector of Euro European uh, policy, um, regardless, regardless of the failing of the competence. I, I said to you that there is no fo full and complete competence of the European legislator in, in the context, but uh, the, the title of the European U Energy Union works like a political program. And uh, this uh, uh, policy on the European Energy uh, Union uh, contains the, f uh, the following dimensions of policy. First of all, uh, and since ever, secur security of energy uh, supply, solidarity among the member states, uh, trust uh, uh, among the member states, so this is all uh, pol uh, only political uh, goals. Again, a completely integrated European energy uh, market. Uh, there appears also energy effici efficiency as the first uh, type and most important uh, type of energy policy. Uh, <coughs> policy. Energy efficiency as reg is regarded uh, like a proper source of energy. Uh, as already mentioned, reduction of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gas uh, emissions and uh, the development of um, external energy policy of the Union, uh, not more bilateral um, relationships uh, uh, between the member states and third uh, energy delivering uh, countries, but the, the, the moreover the European Union wants to speak with one voice um, uh, in the relationship with uh, third uh, countries. All these uh, dimensions of the uh, European Energy Union um, are um, completed by means of um, uh, investigation and uh, development, uh, innovation uh, measures, uh, com uh, co competitiveness. There's a lot of money in the streets, especially for universities, in order to build up European uh, research and uh, investigating uh, projects and, and programs in, uh, in order to, to further develop uh, this, uh, these goals. Well, <coughs> now, um, as already said, the last and, uh, if you like, the fourth um, legislative package of the European legislator uh, came into first. Lot of uh, uh, several acts, uh, directives, and regulations of the uh, European legislator. Let me only briefly uh, uh, comment uh, this, uh, this uh, different acts. We have um, um, an own uh, energy performance of building uh, directive. Uh, all these acts already uh, existed before, but within the, the new uh, energy p uh, package, they have been um, they, they have been reformed, mm? L large re re reform. The same is uh, valid for, for the re renewable energy energy uh, directive, which sets out a framework on the uh, promoting of. Uh, um, generating uh, el especially electricity from renewable energies uh, in the Union. Uh, we have the revised energy efficiency directive on, an, uh, an uh, on the development of uh, efficiency development in the EU. EU. We have um, um, most important also um, an on regulation on the governance of the energy union, union and uh, climate action. That would uh, mean uh, that um, uh, within these regulations, member states are obliged to develop uh, their own programs, their, uh, their own um, climate change uh, protection uh, program uh, in the framework of the Paris uh, uh, Protocol in order to, to, to meet um, uh, together in the European uh, co concert uh, the objectives of the 
um, of the Paris uh, uh, Protocol. We have uh, further on, uh, the, the, the rest is not so interesting, but, but the most, most important um, acts for our, for our context here uh, uh, are uh, um, 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 the regulation at the end, the regulation on the internal market for electricity, and m uh, more than that, uh, the directive on common rules for the internal market uh, for electricity. Directed, uh, directive on common miles markets for common rules for the internal market uh, for, for electricity that would uh, uh, say there's a new market, there has been uh, established a new market design, um, new, new market design for the electricity sector in the union and so far um, that the former design has been replaced or renewed uh, like, you, uh, um, like you may see it uh, by means of uh, climate uh, change uh, uh, protection. Sub to, uh, to some extent, and to, to my view, we have on the one hand the goal of um, electricity market liberalization, market, market, and competition on the one hand, and on the other side, we, 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 we face uh, so-called re-regulation uh, by means of climate uh, change um, oriented uh, uh, provisions in the same uh, uh, legal uh, framework. This is uh, to some extent uh, like, like, the in, uh, uh, like the intent to, uh, um, to make uh, from, from a circle a square, you know, or from, from a square uh, a circle, b because these are two uh, obj objectives of the policy uh, which uh, to some extent um, yeah, uh, differ from, from one another. Let me, let me close my, my lecture uh, with some view, and, and you will particularly be interested in the uh, role of consumers and also of uh, prosumers in the context of the um, European uh, Union legislative package. After the entering of the force, uh, into force of the last uh, and mentioned uh, legislative uh, package, uh, we face uh, new rules uh, on the role of uh, consumers. First of all, one has to say, say um, that the legislators, uh, the European legislators, switched away uh, from uh, more, or more or less uh, passive uh, protection of the uh, consumer uh, instead of uh, giving him to the consumer, to the ele electricity consumer, an active role. Active role n uh, not, not only as an uh, electricity consumer, but also as a prosumer. A uh, prosumer who is uh, at the same time consuming uh, electricity and on the other hand producing uh, um, uh, uh, electricity by means of mini and uh, micro um, generation uh, uh, facilities. Uh, in this context, the um, directives, renewable energy directive and uh, the, the already mentioned directive on the internal uh, reformed uh, directive on the internal markets says consumers are at the center of the ener uh, energy union. The clean energy transition also needs to be fair for those sectors, regions, or vulnerable parts of society affected by the energy transition. Energy transi transition uh, today uh, as a key word uh, and, and key goal of the new legislative uh, package. And we want to help consumers embrace this transition. And how far uh, is this working? The different uh, instruments that had been established uh, within the uh, mentioned directives and regulations. First of all, all consumers across the union will be entitled to generate electricity for either their own consumption, store it, share it, consume it, or sell it back to the market. Uh, broad uh, concept of consumer uh, roles, strengthening this uh, consumer uh, in, the, in the framework of the electricity uh, market. Another uh, po uh, important point, technically s uh, speaking, is the deployment of so-called smart meters. Uh, I uh, suppose that you, you all uh, know what uh, smart meters are. Uh, intelligent uh, electricity consumption and uh, production uh, generation uh, meters which uh, sh shall be employed uh, all uh, over the member states of the European uh, Union. And uh, this um, is, is uh, flanked um, by provisions on so-called dynamic electricity price uh, contracts in our 
in our context, uh, of course, when we are speaking about smart meters, we have to speak about um, the um, data protection, uh, data uh, securing and data protection, uh, but also uh, on the possibility to, to use uh, consumer data uh, in order to develop uh, further um, f f further uh, means and, and tailor-made uh, sol solutions, with which uh, can help help to to f uh, to further develop uh, the, uh, the the market market and uh, which can help to to strengthen uh, the role of the uh, uh, consumer, data protection, data sec security, uh, and so on. On um, further changes uh, for consumers according to the last. Uh, legislative uh, package, as, uh, as uh, says uh, the European Commission, everyday uh, operations like billing, changing suppliers and getting a new contract when moving house uh, will become easier. Um, the consumer shall have access, easier access to reliable and clear uh, information on the best deals in the market. They may have to switch uh, so uh, the suppliers more uh, easily, they may request, legally request a smart meter from the energy uh, su suppliers and um, uh, the, uh, uh, other, other very important um, uh, keyword in this context uh, are the so-called uh, communities of, of uh, consumers. Consumers are allowed, um, not only allowed, they, they are to some extent uh, they, are, they are encouraged to build up so-called communities of uh, consumers. That would uh, say uh, communities, uh, they put uh, them together, thousands of uh, uh, consumers put them together, not all only concerning uh, consumption of electricity, but also producing uh, 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 electricity in order to, to, uh, to participate uh, in, the mar uh, in the market like uh, um, like like a play, uh, market uh, player, uh, you probably have heard uh, have he heard about uh, so-called uh, smart. Uh, how do you call Kraftwerke, smart Kraftwerke, smart power plants that would meet. Uh, that would mean that we, that we switch together uh, thousands and thousands of, of uh, micro and mini uh, generating uh, faci facility in, in the market in order to 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 uh, participate in uh, auctions in electricity auctions, uh, for, for example, in electricity auctions for uh, renewable uh, energy. Uh, many many instruments and mechanisms, but uh, you have also been to mind that that uh, these instruments laid down in the in the legislative package are to some extent vague and uh, ambiguous. They they need uh, uh, still their development by the legislation in, in the uh, uh, member countries of the uh, union. Well, and uh, last uh, so last side from my, from my uh, side. Consumers uh, protect protection. Um, the commission says that uh, the prices, electricity prices, should become uh, increasingly market-based. Market-based, market, market-based. Market this is the main main uh, pillar of the European uh, keyword of the European uh, legislator. Uh, also, a subject uh, fighting against uh, energy uh, poverty in our uh, context. Furthermore. Um, Concerning energy uh, price regulation in the in the uh, member states, there are few member states uh, in uh, like like France, Italy, Spain that uh, still use so-called price regulation for uh, in order to fight uh, fight uh, 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 against uh, energy poverty, especially of private uh, ho households. These uh, price regulations. Uh, has have also to to phase out in order to to, to give place uh, to the market in the electricity uh, sector uh, and uh, so on. I also already mentioned increasing use of smart meter meters. We have a new role of um, of um, consumers and producers, small producers, also by means of uh, demand uh, response uh, uh, instruments. 
and uh, there, there, there's uh, ending uh, already my uh, my slide. I, I hope uh, very much that I give you gave you the imp uh, impression about the development and, and the framework of how uh, works the uh, European uh, liberalization, is, uh, in especially with regard to uh, small uh, consumers and uh, pr uh, producers. As already said, the implementation of these uh, instruments and methods. Um, uh, this, is, this will be task of the uh, national legislator in the uh, upcoming months and, and years. There are two years uh, in order to, to, to transpose the, the new legislative package into national force. And, uh, and so far, I can uh, give <laughs> already the, the word uh, later on to my colleague, Dr. Lang, who will deliver uh, the German uh, fr uh, framework the framework of German law uh, according to uh, the promotion of uh, en electricity generation, uh, from especially from renewable energy. Many thanks, and uh, I'm open to any kind of debate, questions, uh, discussions, and many f uh, thanks for your uh, attention. Shall we debate or start into the discussion, or shall we, shall we uh, follow up with uh, Dr. Lang? Oh. Agradecemos a palestra do professor Christian Piello e o convidamos a tomar assento, já está no auditório. Convidamos neste momento para ministrar a palestra a EEG e a micro e mini geração de energia elétrica, o professor da Universidade Técnica de Berlim, Tu Berlim, o senhor Matias Lang. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful afternoon, great pleasure to be here with you in wonderful Brasilia. I uh, had the pleasure of being here for the second time this year after not having been here all my life before. And I, it's a double the pleasure, uh, is, is, is wonderful. And thank you for having organized this wonderful event uh, and uh, for Guy Zet also for the support in getting us here. Now, um, what do we have today? What I do ha have today? I'm actually mainly a simple lawyer who every now and again does a bit of teaching on energy law subjects uh, in Berlin mainly and in other places. And we're going to talk about uh, renewable support regime, uh, the German renewable support regime. And since I understand you have a bit of a challenge of changing a couple of things in your uh, regime as well, uh, I will uh, talk about some of the experience that we have had with changing uh, the German regime. So this is, this is the plan uh, uh, to, to get through uh, renewable support regime, the background, the way we've organized it uh, in Germany, then uh, some details on that. We will touch upon grid fees because that's another element of dealing with it. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, see how much time we have to talk about uh, the electricity market design. Because as you know, with the changing uh, supply regime, the question is, is the previous regime, or the, we, we had the question, is the regime that we have fit for purpose going forward? Now, mini and uh, micro and mini generation, you know much more about this than I do. Uh, Technically, these are terms that we do not use uh, in the German uh, uh, framework. Of course, we have micro and mini generation as well, uh, and we have differing regimes uh, depending on the size of the generation units. We have the small ones, we have the medium ones, we have the really big ones, and there's a, a very sophisticated system that we have, uh, and we will get into that, of course, we have these these levels, the, the exact cutoff points are a bit in, in other places, but we have that, uh, of course. Now, the uh, German EEG, uh, just to start off with, is started off as a really tiny little law. Uh, originally, in 1991, uh, it started off as a feed-in law, 
uh, uh, just a couple of pages in the Federal Law Gazette, very easy, anybody could read it, you wouldn't need a, you didn't need a, a, a lawyer and not a professor to do it, you just read it and basically pretty uh, good to go. Uh, 2000, we, we changed it a bit to the, uh, now the, the got the new name, the Renewable Energy Sources Act. Uh, it already had grown, 12 pages, uh, 12 sections, three and a half pages, is still something that you could easily read. Now, then uh, renewable energy support took off and the legal regime as well. 2014, we had the EEG 2.0, uh, so no 4.0, just 2.0 at the time. 104 sections, 55 pages, and the traditional part was longer than the original law. Uh, and uh, 2017, we, we did another major revision. Uh, I think we're now at 140, 41 pages, kind of difficult because it was cut in two parts uh, and, and changed in between. So uh, it's getting more and more complicated. This is some really serious legislation that we have covering everything you can think of. And I think we probably tried out everything, or not everything, but m close to everything, uh, where you can spend money on when you uh, want to support renewable energy. So uh, even if you do not like the idea, it may serve as a bad example. We, we've, you know, we have plenty of variations uh, also looking back in history what we've tried out. Now, uh, we have a pretty good plan, uh, and actually, there is some light here. Does it do anything? Oh, here we go. Uh, we, we have a plan, uh, it's wonderful, the plan economy on the renewable side, 40 to 45 percent by, by 25. Uh, we're almost there, uh, we're early on that one, uh, in 80 percent by 2050. Um, whenever I uh, have, have new associates coming along, um, they say, oh, 80 percent sounds good, but uh, this is an average. This actually means that quite for, for quite a lot of the time, and I'll revert to that later, we have more than 100% renewables. And all of all those of you who know how physics works say, well, how do I have more than 100% uh, power? Because it just has to go somewhere. So we are just hoping that by, we, we believe in our German engineers that they come up not only with good cars, but also maybe with a solution to store the data somewhere. Or, or someone from China or someone has to do it because otherwise it's not going to work. Now, this you probably don't want to read, but this is an overview of all the energy legislation that we now have. Uh, the interesting part is we have sort of a European level here, lots of European things. As Apulev has already talked about, just a couple of elements in there, and then we have so all sorts of German things. Uh, the good part now there is for lawyers, uh, nobody knows how this all works together. Uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure how your system works, but I have basically given up on printed uh, energy law. I always look it up on the internet because even if I spend all my day dealing with German energy law, I always am surprised what I find when I look up the law and what has, has changed in the meantime with all the, the activity. Um, the, uh, on, on where are we on the supply side? Uh, we, we are not in the fortunate position to have so much renewable energy uh, 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 hydro energy that as you have. Uh, historically we had nuclear, hard coal, lignite, uh, and uh, oil and gas, uh, uh, very few oil fired stations, uh, a couple of gas fired stations. And this is sort of the renewables part here which has enormously increased. Uh, Germany is the energy country of exits. Uh, so we first decided to exit nuclear and I'll come back to the next exit idea is coal. Uh, when you look at that, it's kind of a challenge and we'll come back to that, how you actually exit that other part uh, as well because you always need to generate it. For those of you who like figures and who are not lawyers, um, uh, this is the, 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 the table of where we are on the renewable side. So this is end of last year. Uh, mix, um, gross power generation, we were at 35%. And this is from there in 2012, and it basically started from close to nothing there in the corner uh, at, at 2000. Um, this is what it looks like, easier to read uh, with colors. Uh, see, on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the hydropower side, we unfortunately had no development because uh, Germans, as much as they like their renewable energy, they don't like uh, 
people changing the landscape too much when it comes to hydro, so it's basically impossible to get anything permitted when you uh, want a new hydro uh, station uh, in Germany, so we've decided to put wind turbines into the countryside. It seems to be easier. Um, now, the interesting part now is something that the German public is not too interested in, interestingly, it's the cost of energy. So we're a wealthy country, uh, and uh, this is where the power price for households has gone. Uh, from 2006, it was about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, and it's now 30. So over about 10 years, we have a uh, 50% increase in, in household prices. If you would have asked me there if this would just go basically without opposition, much opposition from the German public, I would have said mm, probably not. But the reality is people, the general public doesn't really mind uh, and uh, because people kind of like the warm, fuzzy feeling that they're doing something good for the world uh, by having renewable energy. Uh, and most people can afford it, uh, so they mm, don't uh, do it. Of course it's an issue, and of course it's an issue energy poverty, these things, people who do not have a lot of money, they, 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 have, a ch they have a challenge with that, but, but, but we somehow seem to be having enough money to go around to deal with that at the moment at least. It, the general public is not concerned, they take electricity prices sort of as an act of God, uh, and, and like petrol prices, they go up, and there's not much you can do about them. Even though they could, but they don't want to. Uh, the interesting part here, and this is what I, where I want to draw your attention to, this is the actual price of the power. It's, it says procurement and sales. So this is what it actually costs to generate the power. This is the grid fee part, which has increased, but not too much, but a little. And here comes the tax surcharges and contributions. This is all the reallocation bits and pieces plus tax. And I'll come back to that. Uh, we have a really sophisticated system of reallocating the support costs uh, that we have generated. Uh, and when you look at that, uh, it, it's sort of about 50% for the general household. 50% is actually what the power is to, to, to produce it and to get it to the house. And this is basically mm, for political desire to change the system, uh, which has increased enormously the, the prices. Uh, but, as I said, the general public uh, is quite happy about it. Um, here we have the other part, uh, which is the prices for industry, <coughs> and they are, it, the split is a bit different. Uh, here again, this, is the, 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 this part at the bottom is the actual prices for the actual power, and this is sort of the additional, the state-induced bit, uh, the, the EEG surcharge. We have, we have a great number of surcharges now uh, for, for uh, all sorts of uh, additional costs that we've created for offshore surcharge and whatnot. Uh, that goes on top. So, the interesting part now commercially is if you exempt someone from these surcharges, you don't have to pay that, then actually your power price has actually come down from there. So if you're someone who doesn't have to pay this, your power price is actually lower now than it was uh, 13 years ago. Uh, so it's an interesting part because that has been a major driver of a lot of creativity for people, including lawyers and accountants, uh, to create systems to not pay that and, and do that. Uh, in particular for energy intensive industries because if you're an aluminum company, uh, you, have, you have to live with the power prices and, and, and the world market just pays what it pays for it and if you have to pay too much power for it, well, you're not competitive and the same thing happens in other energy intensive industries. Um, this is one of my favorite charts. Uh, uh, all of this data is now freely available. This actually shows, this is a week. Uh, it's the 10th of August, 2019, so it's not very long ago how, uh, sort of what the generation landscape looks like. And when you look at this, this is solar. So we have a, a lot, that was a summer day, nice, sunny, global warming type warm days. Uh, but you see, the wind part, actually, there's a lot of difference on the wind side. And this here is the weekend where people go not working. So uh, there is less load in the system anyway. Uh, and we had very windy, very sunny 
days. So there actually we had more than 100% renewables uh, at uh, midday, around about midday, which when I have new associates come in, they always love it. Say, oh, it's wonderful, we've achieved something, it's 100% uh, renewables. And I said, no, it's a problem. If you have more than 100% renewables, it's a problem because you still have all these other power plants that are producing. You can't take them down to zero, as everybody who's ever tried to run a power plant, you can't just switch it off and go home and then see when the wind comes back or goes off. Uh, so we've been pushing about 10 gigawatts, close to 10 gigawatts into the European uh, power system. We have friendly neighbors uh, who sometimes like and very often don't like uh, us pushing the power into their grids. Uh, uh, and we're, but we pay them for it. And we, when you look at that, this is the price part. Um, so we have negative prices, not surprisingly, because nobody wants the power uh, at that time because it's just too much of it. Uh, so we pay everyone uh, who just, you know, please take the power. Uh, so because it's more than 100%. So um, this is going to be the new normal. You remember we are at 35, 40% sometimes now on average uh, for renewable power. If we go, want to go up to 80, so this is going to be the, the normal situation. Um, and why is that the case? Uh, can we not just replace everything by, by wind turbines and switch them off? No, because, and I took week four this year, when we, you may have followed the discussion that uh, Germany is thinking about exiting coal to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, we had a commission, you know, if you don't know what to do as a politician, you create a commission and then the commission does the thinking for you and then you can take the information from the commission and then make, base your decision on it or do something else, but at least you, you have something to base your decision on or to ignore. Uh, so we have a, a commission uh, that coal commission that looked into exiting coal uh, and they came up, I think it was on the 24th or the 25th, they presented their proposal saying, yeah, it's a good idea, we exit coal. And that was one of those weeks that we often have in winter uh, when it's dark, in particular in the morning and in the evening. Um, and also, despite global warming, we still have days when there isn't so much sunshine. Uh, and the, here, there wasn't a lot even uh, during the middle of the day. So in this week, we had a lot of, and, and this is also not unusual, German peak load in the system is in winter, above 70 gigawatts load, but no wind. And when you look at uh, uh, 24th here, for example, uh, early afternoon, in the middle of winter, there is no sun because it's dark, and there was no wind. So there's no power. So regardless how many PV plants we have and how many wind turbines we install, they're not producing because without wind they don't work and without sun they also don't work. So there we have lignite, hard coal, uh, uh, nuclear. So if we switch all this off, and I mean switch, switch, switch this off anyway, uh, uh, we have hard coal and uh, this uh, lignite and hard coal, if we now switch this off, the interesting question physically is where are we going to get the power from? Uh, but the commission said, no, it's no problem, we do that. So um, we will have to m some do some massive changes to our generation landscape, and we come back to the, to the uh, market uh, issue as well. You know, at what cost can we do this? So, so this is where Germany stands at the moment. We have been really successful, as you've seen, with getting all this renewable power in. Yes, we have that, but we're not quite successful yet in changing the weather to the degree that it actually works all through the year. Um, so we'll, we'll have some work to do on that, uh, but physically we have some challenges because it just needs to be produced when it's consumed. Um, and the prices there you see obviously when there is a lot of demand and the prices are obviously up there far from negative. Um, just now before we get into the sort of the, 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 the other part, just overview of support regimes because when you start supporting more renewable energy, you, you always have a choice. You, you somehow support the generation itself somehow by increasing the prices to some form or fashion. And the other element that you can play around with is with the grid part, because even though uh, <coughs> people have solar panels on the roof or wind turbines, most of the time the consumption that the owners have doesn't 
quite go along with the generation. So you just have a grid element always involved in it. So and e either is it to, to get the excess power uh, to go away or to <coughs> or to just get additional power in because it's just dark and not windy. Uh, so your net metering system, I think, sits somewhere in between. It has a it has a it has a grid element because if you only pay for the net uh, of you do, then well, at least in the in, in, the, in, the, in the clean version, you're not paying for, for, for grids for the, the, the part that you're doing. Um, and support for the generation prices you do, depending on if you do 100% netting on the, on the price or if you do some other system. Uh, what we have done, we have a, we've developed over time a pretty sophisticated system of how we play around with the actual element, the, 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 the what we pay for renewable energy. And we also have a pretty sophisticated system on the grid side, uh, the exemptions that we have. Uh, and I will talk about that uh, since, as you've seen now, we, we don't have 1% of renewable uh, from the PV or the, the, the wind side. We have 35 something. We're spending billions on it every year. Uh, so we've created all sorts of uh, additional things. Um, the EEG structure um, is well, as you know, I've, I've talked about the EEG, it's Renewable Energy Sources Act. Uh, idea is to have uh, re energy supply in a sustainable manner, generate renewable energy from renewable sources. We do that with everything. Hydro is included, uh, uh, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, is everything in there. You already know that. And it has actually worked reasonably well when you look at the huge figures of, of, of generation capacity. This is, is peak capacity. Uh, 45, 60, or well close to, we're getting close to, to 50 gigawatts on the PV side, uh, and, and, and we're more above that on the wind side. Uh, so you already know this. We've got this enormous increase here. You remember there we started off with this little feed in act in 2000 when the EEG got its name, and this is where it's gone. Um, <coughs> but actually, constant change is the key element of renewable energy support. Um, the VEEG is a living animal uh, that is changing its shape and form every, well, I've just included some names here, 2000, 2004, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2017. These are major revisions of the EEG. Some get their own name, some don't. Sometimes they don't officially have the name, but everybody talks about them. Uh, but in reality, there are all sorts of additional changes in between. If one thing is certain on the renewable support thing, it's changed all the time. Um, sometimes, in reality, it's therefore difficult actually to see what EEG applies to, to the individual installation because the way we've been doing it is mostly we've grandfathered things. So once you build your plant, sort of it gets its EEG and it's kind of frozen in place unless certain things are changed. So I have sitting on my desk, this is actually where I keep paper versions of the law. I have all sort of the different versions of the EEG. Whenever a client asks me sort of what do I get for that, I say, oh, when, from when is it? And then can't you just look it up? I said, yeah, I, this is sort of in the middle of the pile, but I need to see all the changes that will happen in between. So what is it that you actually want to know? Uh, so constant change is the thing. We've been revising it very, very often. Uh, to adjust it to technological development, we'll come back to that, changing prices, particularly on the supply side, build up of new capacity if we have too much or not enough. Uh, cost considerations, of course, play, uh, they come into play. Political priorities change, uh, and a multitude of other reasons. So it's been changing all the time. Uh, so just to go through, you know most of this, uh, uh, sophisticated scheme for almost everything. Uh, <coughs> the the we, we want growth. There is one thing we don't want is to have the cheapest form of renewable energy. We want a mix of all sorts of things. It's not entirely clear how the mix is determined, but it's clear that we want to mix. We also want it not to be too expensive, but it can be a bit more expensive. We do not have a have a really clear line as sort of how we do that. That's part mainly due to then sort of the, the political process who decides that. Uh, the EEG itself at, uh, is, is a, a, a really sophisticated law that has, uh, well, protection against 
all standard line of defenses. If you're an incumbent and don't want renewables to come in, you can come up with all sorts of ideas how to stop it. Uh, the EEG basically has provisions for everything, uh, for everything all DSOs or incumbents have ever tried. We've put something into the EEG to stop them from doing it because we want more renewables. Uh, so obligation to connect uh, the system to the grid, to build up the grid. You cannot just say, oh, there's no grid where you want to build your plant. Say, well, I build my plant anywhere you get my, your grid to my plant, and so I can produce. Uh, so there's lots of things in there and lots of case law in between, and the banks kind of like it. Uh, uh, it was very easy to finance anything. Uh, let's now go, go through the details. Above market remuneration historically determined by state. We started off with the famous fixed feed-in tariffs, uh, but we have, as I said, we, we don't just want the cheapest one. We have different versions. We can't uh, uh, say, okay, for PV at the moment, the market we think is there, so we have a different, different thing for different uh, animals. Uh, historically, it was all states set. You were quicker with your auctions. Uh, uh, Germany was quite hesitant to to do auctions, we, we didn't quite trust the market because then that would mean that the cheapest version would get get sort of priority and we didn't really want that because we wanted the mix, we wanted to different technologies to develop. <coughs> so so uh, that, that took a while. We now also have auctions, we now have I think everything. Um, we, we, pl we, we started this, uh, the, the, uh, the auction part, we started with freestanding solar. Uh, uh, but we, what we don't have is net metering. Uh, that would be too easy, uh, just, uh, just having one thing and, and have that. We have some, there are actually some people do guerrilla PV uh, generation who just plug in a, 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 a solar panel on their uh, sort of terrace and then do that. It's, it's sort of getting a bit more lawful now, not if you just do your own net metering where your meter goes back and forth, because we always meter everything that goes in and then goes out, and then we do that. So. Um, but in reality, we don't have many net metering. Uh, the <coughs> support is always 20 years plus year of commissioning. I mean, commercially, that's always the question. It's an Excel sheet exercise. Uh, okay, if you get that for 20 years plus year of commissioning, this is what it costs, this is the expected return. And then the investor comes along and says, okay, this is the ROI I want with my risk profile. And then does it make sense, yes or no? Um, technically, we don't need a power purchase agreement. Uh, the grid operator just has to, to, to take the power. Um, <coughs> so key element historically is that the grid operator has to pay the EEG remuneration. As I said, anybody who produces renewable energy in the easy version with the feed-in tariff, you just produce it, you, you just fit it into the grid and you get the money uh, that you have for it. The bigger ones, we have sort of a more sophisticated system of market premiums and, 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 and that needs to be sold. So sort of as a kind of a flaw on the price um, uh, and the uh, and and certain reallocation uh, the, the, the the cost that the system generates are then pushed up to the transmission system operators and they reallocate it and I have this uh, uh, and I, I think it's one one slide further down uh, with a picture of how what it looks like um, what I just wanted to point out is we've never been really good in predicting how much new capacity we build because originally when you don't have, I mean, it's easy when you have an auction or say you build, yeah, you have a right to do one megawatt, uh, one gigawatt or whatever. We always historically had sort of an idea what we wanted and then put out the feed-in tariff, but it never quite worked out uh, because uh, and then you see that sort of we have a corridor um, and we were always above, below. Historically, we were actually far above uh, so it's uh, for PV, 2,500. For uh, for some years before that, they they wanted 2,500 and had seven uh, seven gigawatts. So this is what we, we we do here. But we're getting sort of better at trying to align that. But here, onshore wind, for example, we got the the pricing a bit wrong. Uh, there you see, if you, we wanted two and a half uh, gigawatts and got five, four, uh, four and a half, five plus something. So which of course makes it difficult for the grid operators to get the grid uh, to play along with it. Um, well how do you do planning if, if you sort of you're, you're so far off? It's easier if you have, um, if you have auctioning. Um, 
So you already know that one, uh, so that's the uh, part. Now, the, the big beauty uh, of the system is we need to, we need to reallocate the cost uh, in the system. Someone has to pay for it. Uh, as much as you want renewable energy, someone has to do it. And this is the written part. This is easier to understand. So if you uh, generate the power here, you, s you sell it to the, dis well, you, you put it into the grid of distribution system operator, and he pays you money back. But then the distribution system operator pushes it up to the transmission system operator. The transmission system operator sells it. For example, I mean, or originally, I don't know, I, I started off uh, on PV parks when the kilowatt hour was 36 cents per kilowatt uh, hour, and the market price was in the range of six. So by the time it got up here, the transmission system operator lost 30 cents on every kilowatt hour. Uh, uh, so they collect all the billions uh, that they lose in this part, uh, do a calculation uh, by the 15th of uh, September every year, say, okay, how much are we likely to lose next year? Uh, and then they calculate and how much power are we likely to sell, and then they charge that as the EEG surcharge to the utility who passes it on to the electricity consumer. And if it doesn't quite out with the calculation, you just, the balance you push into the next year. So. Uh, that, that's how the system works. And you don't have to read these figures, but uh, it's, it's basically banking for TSOs. Uh, they just collect the money, they do that, uh, and that was for 2018. They had 26 point something billion euros that they spent because of payments to, to TSOs generators, and they got about 1.8 million, a billion when they sold it. So they made a hefty loss. Um, on this, and those 24 billion had to be pushed to the uh, consumers. So it's, it's sort of it's pretty transparent. You can go up on the website. You can see every day where the account stands. In summer, it usually is redder than other because its PV power was historically more expensive. Uh, so you can see that, and that this is done every year, and it goes goes into the system. So if you if you want to look at that, that that's for every year for every month. You can look at these figures. Um, <coughs> so, and but just just to keep in mind, this is a huge figure. I mean, this is 24 billion euros every year. There's a hell of a lot of money in there, and there's a uh, quite a few people who actually do make some money with this. Lawyers, but also the uh, the 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 people who build these systems. The lobby to keep the machine going is really strong is probably one of the strongest lobbies that we have is the renewables lobby. They, of, your, of course, if you're renewable, you have the advantage that you are saving the world, uh, but there is also for some, the commercial element is relevant, and there is, there's a lot of money in the system, uh, and there's a lot of people who have an interest in keeping this running, uh, the system. That's, that's whenever you change anything in the system, you actually get some pressure. Uh, from people who don't like the change the way it's proposed because if you take only 10% away from that, it's two and a half billion euros. So uh, it's a lot of money. Uh, uh, in 2017, we changed the law. Uh, I'll just quickly go through that uh, this, because this is the, the, the latest iteration that we have. Um, it's uh, in Germany, and, and, and you already mentioned, a lot of this is driven by European state aid law. Germany developed the EEG originally under a concept saying this is not state aid, this is German law, the European Commission has nothing to say about it. Uh, then the Commission came along and said, hey guys, if you have, are planning to have 80% of your market outside of European uh, control, that kind of, we think we should have a say in that as well. And isn't this state aid law, if you reallocate all those billions every year, the European Commission developed an argument saying this is state aid law. Germany said, no, it's not. Uh, after a while now, the European um, Court of Justice sided, uh, interestingly, with Germany is not state aid law. But along the way, for since 2004, four, three, four, five, since 2014, since that EEG, we basically thought that we were state aid law and that we had to do all the things that the European Commission on the state aid law wanted, and we did that. Uh, and the, uh, these, all the changes then were in Germany were done under the influence of European state aid law, in particular 
uh, the commission wants competition and wants auctioning. It doesn't want price setting by some obscure parliamentary commission, uh, but it wants to get the prices set by, by, by the market. Uh, and so we, we introduced, um, we introduced uh, auctions. Um, and uh, in that context, we, we had three principles that we finally, after uh, how many years, we tried to get actually the growth to stay in the corridor that we have to make it a bit more predictable, because otherwise the grid is just not going to be able to deal with it. Um, then we had this thing, it shall be cost effective. Um, it, does, it doesn't mean it shall be cheap. And it doesn't mean we do using the cheapest version, but somehow rain in cost, uh, because it was getting out of hand. And then we had this additional part, all actors shall have fair chances during the tenders, plurality of actors. Again, meaning, translated, it's not the cheapest uh, bidder that shall win. We, we shall also include some other things. Uh, so we have some small ones, some middle ones, we have some communities, we do all sorts of things. So, so it's German renewables policy is not driven by getting the, sh the cheapest uh, or the most secure version out there, but getting a variety of things. Um, but the key driver in 2017 was that 80% of, of, of renewables generated really has to go through an, uh, a <coughs> excuse me, an auctioning system. Uh, but the key part is, as nice as that looks on the one hand, the thing with the grandfathering is the important part. I think this part of the success of the German renewable system is that we have paid a lot of attention to grandfathering rules. Uh, meaning that whenever we change something, it basically goes forward for new systems starting at a certain time. Then the new regime applies. The existing plants that were created and were based and calculated on 20 years plus year of uh, installation, they basically keep their old system. Uh, and so while it says 80% of uh, electricity generated um, by renewables is done by auctions, it means only going forward. And as you see, we already have whatever, 50 gigawatts of PV and 60 gigawatts of wind installed that still follow the old system. So, so that's the, the concept. So the way it's done is we, we have all these sort of new systems on top of the old ones. Uh, uh, so, so, but th this is the latest iteration uh, for, for 2017. So when you look at it historically, we started off with feed-in uh, tariffs. In 2014, we, we did uh, mandatory direct marketing with a market premium system, system ensuring a minimum payment for systems. And now we have in the EEG 2017, the auction system. But all exist on top of each other because if you have something that was built in 2000, it has the, still has the feed-in tariffs. So we have all these things on top of each other. Um, now to support reductions, and I briefly mentioned that already. <coughs> I'm just a lawyer. I mean, I, I was a banker before I became a lawyer, so I can read, read figures. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, historic price development of PV modules. It's just the modules. It's not the uh, balance of, of the system, the, the rest. But still, it's a very clear uh, Development. So if you start with support payments here somewhere, and if you don't change them, obviously it gets hugely profitable here uh, when the modules come down. So it's very easy even for me as a lawyer to see that you cannot just keep one payment system along because you know the longer you wait, uh, the bigger the profit is if you don't change the, 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 the tariffs. So if you, if you want to kind of keep it the same, you just somehow have to lower it uh, to do that. Um, and Here's the, uh, uh, the uh, yeah, with the, with the additional costs on top. So they come down, but not as much. But here you see what the total cost of the system price is. This, I think, is the key element when you uh, want to discuss the need for uh, reductions. Uh, so what does this fancy graph show? Um, this is, let's just take new PV roof systems, small ones, which is sort of close to the micro thing. So that we did something here, and then, oh, we said, oh, we need to do more because we want more, we want more people to have these things on their roof, so we put them up, 
and then there was a system do 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 goes down. So there was a lot of discussion here, sort of how quickly this goes, and most of the time when they were reduced, and they in connection with a change, people said this is going to be the end of the PV world if we do this this way. Uh, you're doing it far too much. Um, in the end, it hasn't. Well, they're still there. Uh, this is the uh, for larger systems. Uh, so here, where there are fairly regular intervals, where we just kind of try to track this. But as this kind of get got out of control here, this was an area where it actually got out of control. Uh, this one was too too slow here, so they had to take it down quicker. You can see this here, and these these sort of irregulatory uh, things here actually led to the changing of the system, where we then introduced a system that has very incremental changes. We try to play this sort of, okay, every other year we do something and we have a fixed system of reductions, but the markets were much quicker than the regulator or the, the, go the government, and Germany is not the regulator, it does it, it was done through parliamentary act. It was just too slow in reacting to, 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 the, uh, this, to this price curve. Yeah, I mean, this is algorithmic. So uh, the here at this time, the, the um, the sort of the legislator was too slow, and we've then introduced a system, and this sort of came in here, uh, which says, okay, we want a corridor, and we monitor very closely how much is built every month, and you only get your feed-in tariff if you report your newly built uh, plant to the federal network agency. Net federal network agency keeps a list and looks at it every month and says, okay, we are at X, we want, well, the plan is we want 2.5 per year. When we just estimate based on what we have, we are only at 1.9, so it's not enough, so we have to decrease, well, we change the, what we call digression. So the, the prices always go down. The only question is how quickly shall they go down? Is it 1% per month? Is it 1.5% per month? Is it 1.9? You can debate that until the cows come home. You never know in advance, and the way we've ended up doing it is say, okay, well, we just put something in there. If the, we are not on the right course, we just change it, so we increase or decrease the digression to try to force the uh, sort of the, the, the prices uh, with the development on the, on the cost side together. Uh, and that, this is sort of how this sort of came about, and so there you see this is getting much slower here. These are now the new ones from, from the tenders, which actually went way below, actually probably too low, uh, and sort of it up again. So this is sort of how we've done. And on, on this part here, this is the gross domestic electricity price. You know that we are at 30% now. This is far more than, than what you pay for generator for, for, for a PV system. And this is the uh, electricity price for small industry. Uh, but you can very easily see that in everywhere here, here it sort of came below the price. This one is a curve which I just want to draw your attention to. Is as much as we bring prices down, as I said, we have always the new ones on top of the old ones, meaning that the the average uh, feed-in tariff for PV is coming down much slower because we had big numbers built here, s seven gigawatts per year at pretty high prices. So, and those are going to be around for 20 years plus year of installation, meaning that the average price is not coming down as quickly as, as, uh, as these prices here suggest, as, as low as they are here. We still have a big fleet of plants uh, which get paid a lot more, and this is why the price is up here. So, uh, but this, I think, is, is, a, is a good um, good chart to show, well, you, and, and I'm sure you, you have these charts uh, sitting somewhere on your desks uh, as well. Uh, I think it's very clear that you need to do something about it. Uh, the question is, of course, how quickly and how, how fast you do it and what system you employ but we developed this, this system. And, and this, again, you don't want to look at all these figures, but this is the Excel sheet that the Federal Network Agency produced, and this is the last one <coughs> that we, we're using. You see there the Federal Network Agency gets the data, how many uh, new systems, what the uh, peak capacity is, April, May, June, July, do, do, do. Then they add this up, say, okay, 1.4 gigawatts, and then they do the calculation. Hmm, if we add all this up, actually we're below uh, our corridor, so we're building not enough, so the, we ch change the digression, so we don't reduce prices as much as we previously did, so they come down slower, uh, so this goes in there. And then here we have then the resulting prices for systems up to 10 kilowatt peak, up to 40 kilowatt peak, up to 700 kilowatt peak, 
which is for residential buildings, um, and this is other installations. So, so it's a pretty sophisticated system trying to align the build-up uh, with the price curve uh, on the on the supply side to somehow get this in line with uh, what we want to do. So, I think the discussion about reductions is 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 sort of a, is not a problem these days is always that the challenge is do you get the system right at the moment there is a debate on the German wind side that the, the wind people are saying yeah you got it wrong with the auction so we're not building as much as we want on the other hand the wind guys onshore wind guys for many years built far more than they were supposed to so uh, again now on the wind side it's likely to be the end of the world it's difficult for many yes uh, but uh, they have been over building for many years making more money than they originally was planned. Now they're making far less than, than is planned, which is, of course, a problem for some, which is very difficult. It's just, to, just to show we still haven't found the ideal solution doing it. We've been playing around with it for many years. We've developed systems. It's very clear that you do that, and, and you run into fierce opposition uh, if you get it wrong. But I think conceptually people agree that you need to do something about it, because otherwise you just, it's just the costs spiral out of control. So, <coughs> balancing different interests, you have an interest in self-generated energy due to financial support, and someone has to pay for it, and you just somehow have to align these things, and you just need to decrease uh, the cost. So, conclusion, on that end, uh, support reductions we found to be necessary to align the support regime with the changing environment. Uh, you need to reduce support payments you somehow then, and we come back to that later, increase cost contribution of renewables generators. There's a specific part that we have, and I talk about that, where we include the renewables generators also now in the cost of that they are creating. Uh, <coughs> aim is to have a meaningful buildup of capacity at reasonable cost. Uh, and historically, we had a somewhat opaque system of uh, setting the feed-in tariffs and getting the support level done and the reductions very much influenced by political aims and interest groups. You've seen that it kind of worked. It wasn't quite exactly where we wanted it to be, but it sort of worked because one of the key aims was to have a lot of renewable energy generation capacity in a short time. People were willing to pay the price, and the general public did not really complain about it. Uh, um, uh, now we have the, 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 the part with the uh, auctions, which is, is a new element. Uh, we've had, and, and we have lots of stories how, how much opposition uh, uh, was there for the, the uh, when, when the system was changed. Every time you do this, you are getting into someone's interest area, and obviously they have good arguments to do that, and it's very difficult. For, for, for the politicians involved, for the people in the ministries, for the regulators to actually see wh what is right, what is wrong, uh, what, what do you do with the data. You get all these different places, and it, it's a challenge. Uh, uh, but, but if there's so much money on the table and so much important policy, if you say, yes, we want renewables, well, then obviously you have strong, strong, uh, strong feelings from people to go after you. Um, Prosumer support, um, the, um, the sort of German version is quite interesting. It was never originally one that we wanted to have. It wasn't something where we said, oh, yeah, we want the, you know, lawyers, dentists, and something to put uh, uh, PV panels on their roofs uh, and produce that or put them on, 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 on apartment buildings. Um, so we, we do not specifically said that. What we wanted was, yes, it's good to have a spread out generation capacity. So we have elevated feed-in tariffs for small systems so you can actually put them on your roof. And the bigger they get, the lower they get. So we had that. But was never, so, so that was built into the system, but it was never really discussed as, as micro-generation. It was something, uh, yeah, we want that. We want the different systems. We just want to play it out. Um, uh, the, the key driver, interestingly, at the end of self-supply was the commercial interest of the EEG surcharge that you've seen. When you pay seven cents per kilowatt hour uh, just for 
as part of the reallocation of costs for renewables, then if you can save that amount of money, is very is a very strong incentive. And what we ended up uh, having is big many what you know if you're a big chemicals company, you built your own plant uh, because then you were not supplied with power. You built your own, then you didn't have to pay the EEG surcharge for the power that was supplied. So you all of a sudden your plant could actually be far more expensive than the big one sitting right next to that. But if you save seven cents per kilowatt hour, it could be less efficient and you could still save money. So um, in 2014, uh, we reversed course because it was just you know getting out of hand, um, introducing a rule that also if you generate your own power, you have to pay the EEG surcharge, which of course created a stir, uh, in particular on the side of the renewables guys who said, hey, uh, I'm having a PV thing on my roof and I'm getting whatever cents per kilowatt hour. Why should I pay for what I'm getting? Uh, that's unfair. It's totally unfair. Um, and I said, yeah, but still, you are creating the cost and so somehow you should contribute. So we ended up, and I come back to that with some kind of compromise with a percentage wise and it's changing. But, but the idea was somehow we have to do something about it because otherwise fewer and fewer people will have to pay for more and more of the costs, which will then increase it for the ones who are left out, uh, left, left to have to pay for it. So we have a, now have a pretty sophisticated system on top of that as well. Um, so, uh, and we cannot, I will not talk about the details, it's in my slides. The rules on how this works are longer than the original EEG. Uh, and and the, because then the exclusion, so you say, okay, you have to pay EEG surcharge on every kilowatt hour that you generate. And I say, guys, hey, guy, I'm running a power plant. I need power to just run my plant. You don't want me to pay for that. So, okay, no. So we take that out. Uh, and then guys go, oh, well, we're not connected to the grid, so I'm not bothering anyone. Okay, we take that out. Uh, so we went through all sorts of uh, uh, things where that was done. Then we have small ones, you know, if you have on your rooftop, the tall, sort of your small house thing, 10 kilowatts. Ah, uh, yeah, no, probably not. Uh, uh, if you get up to 10 megawatts. So it's uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, it should be 10 megawatt hours. Um, uh, so, so there's a pretty sophisticated system to do that. Uh, <coughs> and so general consent, yes, they have to pay for it unless they are renewable power. <coughs> and then came some sliding scale in 2015. It was introduced in 2014, 30%, then 35%, then 40%. We've developed that a bit further now in the latest version. The commission liked the idea. So uh, th this is sort of how we've done to somehow reallocate the cost. I it's, a, it's a mixed system. Uh, we, again, the big thing is we try to maintain the old existing exemptions and just only do it to new ones, which is kind of tricky for the really big generators. Uh, uh, so there is some, some playing around with that. New installations, you're not included, then of course you can start debating, okay, how are you treating my old installation if I'm changing something in my old installation? Or how much can I change in my old installation without you asking me to pay more for it? So there are lots of details in the law. Um, uh, I have them in here, you know, 40% for those, something for them. And then we have rules. I'm just listing them. don't want to go through them. There is, you know, a lot of specific rules. Who does what? How is it measured? Who has to report what? How do these things go? Uh, it's a pretty sophisticated system now. Uh, presumer support, yes, but the idea is somehow we have to make sure that the costs are in some equitable way reallocated in the system. So uh, Federal Network Agency is involved in there as well, but I think that's, that's the, the key, key part. Now, um, grid, uh, quickly. <coughs> the grid fees actually are not very much at the center of the general public's attention yet. And you've seen, you remember when I uh, showed you the original part, the cost didn't go up so much. Actually, they went up a, lo a little, down a little, it wasn't so much. The cost will actually go up now because we're now really changing the, the, the transmission system. Um, uh, so the cost will go up and we're again doing really expensive things uh, in the system. So this will 
be more relevant going forward. Conceptually, here you already know this part. So here, this is the grid part. So it came up from there to there. In between, sometimes it was already uh, here. So, um, so this is the uh, development. Uh, about quarter is for grid. Uh, the changes that we need to make to the grid because of renewable energy are uh, increasing the cost, and we'll we'll have to see how how that plays out. Uh, conceptually. <coughs> Uh, for the grid fees, uh, they are established by the network operators, uh, distribution system operators, mainly on the distribution system. There is a system to authorize that from the uh, federal network agency. Uh, the grid user uh, pays for it. Uh, if you just say buy your power at home, it's just included in your in your bill. There's a a a, a system. Uh, with different elements uh, of uh, of the grid, there's a lot. Those of you who are in the grid area know sort of the, the different ways how to allocate prices. I think what I want to mention is this incentive regulation scheme that we have to incentivize the grid operators to become more efficient. It's a pretty sophisticated system. Sort of what goes into the cost space that they have. The Costs that are triggered by the need for upgrades to the system because of renewable energy are costs that they cannot influence, so they don't really have a problem with that. Uh, they just get that into their ba in their asset base, and they can uh, sort of the interest is calculated, and that so so that part is not something that they can influence because it's driven by other factors. Um, so we try to simulate competition in the system through the pricing system. It's pretty sophisticated. Uh, with regulatory periods uh, and, and sort of the idea is to set a certain framework in which the grid operators optimize their system uh, and, uh, and, and um, sort of can make some money going forward. At the end of the day, uh, the consumer has to pay for it unless the consumer is again exempted from grid fees uh, as part of some support function, which uh, energy intensive industries, for example, are exem exempted because uh, one, it's a support part, and two, energy intensive companies, which is a currently debate whether this is true or not, but this, uh, if you have a really heavy user, 7,000 hours per year, uh, taking a band of power, that stabilizes the grid as well because you know what's happening in your grid. So, so as you have a minimum power, and how do you price that into? Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big debate. Um, long story. There's very little grid fee debate at the moment. Um, the increasing grid fees also triggered by renewable energy are starting to attract some political attention. Um, it's little, little discussion <coughs> on the cost triggered. It's sort of, for many, a cost of doing business. As much as they accept cost of renewables, they kind of accept the cost of the grid. Nobody, nobody wants the new power lines in their back garden. Uh, People want wind energy, and they don't want the wind turbine in their garden. So it's good if the wind turbine is up way in the North Sea, but then they don't want the power line to go there. We're currently sp experimenting with putting the cable underground, which costs six, seven times as much, depending on the technology and where you are. Sometimes it's even more than that. So if we continue doing that, that will massively increase f grid fees going forward. There are currently some pilot projects which I personally work on, and you are writing the, the legal commentary on on how to permit uh, these these uh, these lines. So um, it's not yet much of a debate, but for those in the know, they know this is an issue that will come. Now, just very quickly on market design, um, you. The, the, the challenge is, can the existing, we have an energy only market, uh, and I assume I don't have to explain the energy only market here in this room, how this works, uh, and the merit order and all these things, you all know this. So we have that as well. Obviously, if you have zero marginal cost renewable energy at the front of the merit order, that brings down the price. It makes it more difficult price-wise for all the others, the, uh, the conventional ones, the oil, the gas, the whoever is on the expensive side of the merit order. Uh, historically, you didn't have to worry about it because everyone in the merit order was able to produce at any time of the day. So security supply was something that was sort of figured into the price but didn't need to be 
put into an extra part because everybody had it now with, with renewables at the front of the merit order. It's a totally different story. If you have a third, uh, the, then, then the, the way to deal with it is the system cost. Who is sort of paying for the cost of balancing the system? How do you do that? The renewables don't pay for it. Uh, they are balanced by the others. Um, and, the, and obviously the others are saying, hey guys, this is unfair. Uh, so we need to get some compensation for that. Uh, so we had this review. Uh, do we need to change it? In particular, do we need a capacity market uh, or not? Um, this is, for those of you who are interested, there, there is actually, when that was done, there was pretty, pretty, we did a pretty good job on the legislative part uh, and on the papers that were provided, uh, I think. Um, uh, to in this legislative pro, pro, uh, project uh, where we looked into the different alternatives. The bottom line was, again, a political decision. Uh, no, we don't want a capacity market. We want free, free price formation on the electricity market. Obviously, if you have a, a, a times of tight supply when renewables are not generating, that means you need very high prices, and if you then have picking plants that only operate whatever, 100 hours a year, to make them work in a commercially viable way, you have sky ro high rocket uh, uh, power prices. The government or the, the, the parliament said, no, this is what we want to do. I personally have some doubts that if we really hit those really high prices, that this will be politically acceptable then but since this, this is not now, and this is not in the current legislative period, it's not the problem of those who dealt with it this time. Eventually, it will have to be dealt with. Um, but we added, and I don't know if I have that in there, we added now a big system of all sorts of different capacity instruments. We have, of course, the normal primary, secondary, tertiary reserve. But then we have a winter reserve. The Federal Network Agency looks at it and said, uh, how much how much do we need because this is happening in the grid here we're switching something off in the south of Germany we have a problem with with plants so so there is a sort of a whole set of capacity instruments sort of created outside of the energy market the electricity market um, to make sure that sufficient capacity is available last year was it in February we had the situation where Germany was down to the last operating power plant because France had a problem in its nuclear fleet. It was a cold time. I think they had a problem with several of the plants being in maintenance, then some frozen water, the usual thing that happens in winter. France was down. France needed, uh, I think they were down to minus seven gigawatts or something. Germany, yeah, you know, it was winter, it was dark, uh, was down too. Uh, and uh, so basically we fired up whatever we had and I think we were up to the last major unit that was running. So if now one of the big ones had blown up or one of the big power lines had decided to end the work, we would have had a problem. It not, didn't happen. So nobody had to decide what to do, whether we switch off the power transmission to France or whether we say, oh no, Cologne, we sit in Dusseldorf, we don't like Cologne, we just have Cologne in the dark. Uh, 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 so. Um, we didn't have to decide that. It was, was pretty tight. It wasn't widely reported. Um, so it worked out, and it has always worked out. So that's why not many people are thinking it's an issue. Um, for the time being, we think we're not having a capacity market. I think the issue will be very, very quickly revisited if we have a major blackout. The likelihood of blackouts has increased uh, in the German system. Uh, it's not something people want to talk about. Uh, uh, so let's see. Um, I personally think unless we, well, if we won't have a blackout, nothing is going to happen. We're going to keep on continuing to do it this way. If we have one, which is highly unusual, it will cost an, a fortune. Uh, but, uh, well, then, then we deal with it then. Uh, for the time being, we think it's not necessary to do it. And I believe the experts uh, who tell me that it's not necessary. Uh, so, if you want to look this up, uh, this green paper, white paper, and the Electricity Market Act, these papers are, I think, quite good. Every associate in my team has to read them when they get in there because it describes how market, the market works, how the merit order curve works, uh, how these things 
uh, work, and there was actually a pretty good analysis. It was actually written for the parliamentarians, uh, so to, to try to educate them to get their head around the electricity market. So I think it's actually pretty, and it exists in English as well. So uh, if you want to look that up. Um, yeah, uh, we already talked about the, uh, the, the uh, key, key element, key uh, um, guarantee free, free price formation. We increased monitoring. Um, of course, this is sort of something part of the digitalization, but also gathering more data. Yeah, the better we know what's happening in the system, we do that. Then this thing, what we call strengthening balancing group fidelity. Historically, power generators didn't just cheat in their balancing group because you could earn a quick buck in the market by going short on your system and then hoping for the transmission system operator to kick in. And as you as you knew that the reserve power was only a couple of cents and the market was elsewhere, you just, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's something you didn't used to do. Then some traders decided that this was a business model. So we sort of went in there and tried to do that so that the TSOs don't have to uh, use all their balancing power just to, to increase the profit of some traders. Um, the regime itself, uh, we have, and I already mentioned that, we now have all sorts of additional reserve, the network reserve. We also have, a, well, all sorts of reserves, uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's one part there. Um, one fence, strange thing, I'm just mentioning it because you are all here, uh, electricity regulator. We had a really fancy, or still have a fancy thing. Uh, we pay people for decentralized, um, generation for avoided grid fees. The concept being if you have decentralized generation, you actually need less of the grid and it, you somehow then should be compensated for that for your decentralized uh, generation because you are putting less strain on the grid. It's, it's like you save some money, the, the, the whole system saves some money by having that. Uh, <coughs> now, the problem was in theory that's okay. It doesn't work when uh, you, you're not just having people decide where that is. And kind of, at the end of the day, we found out in particular with renewables, the opposite is true. You have decentralized feed-in of renewables in the wrong place, it actually, you have increased uh, costs, so you cannot pay people something in addition for decentralized feed-in uh, to do that. So again, we started this using our old system, we changed the system going forward, and then uh, doing that. Um, Electricity market 2.0, uh, I think we've covered uh, most of the points. Uh, keep the energy only market, accept future price strikes. Uh, the market shall solve this, uh, have some additional capacity instruments, uh, have all sorts of uh, new ones. So the bottom line is the result of our analysis of the electricity market was we basically keep the old one, we, we add a couple of capacity instrument things to make sure that uh, 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 we, we have this available, we have additional monitoring so we know better what's happening and we, the people who try to play the system on, the, on, the, on that side, they get a slap on the finger uh, so they don't do that. Uh, yeah, uh, conclusion. Um, road to energy transition via uh, renewable support schemes. We want to support generation, we have that. We have support a support system for generation prices. We have a less developed but still existing uh, uh, system that deals uh, with the grid prices, who we support and what we incentivize and disincentivize. The, the, the whole system is focus, focused on supporting certain market participants to create incentive for a natural growth. You know, I don't know, natural, that's, that's the term that is used. I think it's not really so natural because we're kind of creating it to have it in the different areas. We call it natural, but it's basically a design growth in the different areas and not in just one place. <coughs> the idea now is clearly to gradually reduce the support while making sure that the market is not in balance. Germany has been pressured to quite some degree by the European Commission uh, to do that, but has, I think, to many, uh, in, in many areas, actually accepted that very well, and we've come up with some pretty good ideas. Uh, 
the idea now is to support the market until supply and demand manage to mature, manage to mature uh, market uh, self-sufficiently itself. That's the idea. This is a challenge. Uh, the key challenge is that you have to manage change all the time because of the changes on the, uh, on the technological side uh, and on also on the commercial inventiveness of the players to play your rules in such a way that they optimize their personal profits rather than getting the system uh, in the cheapest way. So any regulator always has to be very mindful of what the players are doing. Uh, probably a regulator is closer to that than you are as a normal politician because you're, you are closer. Um, uh, and uh, you're very likely to have some people who are very unhappy about your decisions. Uh, to some degree, you need to live with that. That comes with the, <laughs> this is part of the job description. Uh, so, uh, and if there's a lot of money involved, obviously, and a lot of political desire, uh, that, that also is, of course, a challenge uh, that you need to deal with. But you know this better than I do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Agradecemos o professor Matias Lang e o convidamos a compor a mesa, mais uma vez por gentileza. Convidamos também o professor da Universidade de Brasília, é, convidamos para compor juntamente com o professor Christian Pilov, a mesa, por gentileza. Convidamos ainda o professor da Universidade de Brasília, Miller Cairo, e também o procurador-geral da ANEL, Luiz Eduardo Diniz Araújo, para tomarem assento à mesa e iniciarmos a sessão de perguntas. Nós informamos ainda que quem desejar realizar as perguntas, por gentileza, faça um aceno com as mãos, que os nossos assessores estarão levando até as senhoras ou senhores o microfone. Boa tarde a todos. Primeiro, muito obrigado pela presença, pelo interesse. É... A ANEL acaba de quebrar mais um paradigma, expandindo suas fronteiras. Eu acredito que é a primeira vez que professores alemães participam de um debate jurídico acadêmico aqui na Agência Nacional de Energia Elétrica. Eu gostaria de agradecer, em nome da Agência Nacional de Energia Elétrica, os professores Matias Lang e Christian Pilov, que deixaram o frio do outono alemão para estarem aqui em Brasília, em Düsseldorf está fazendo, nesse exato momento, 7 graus. Em Bochum, 6 graus. Muito obrigado por virem a Brasília compartilharem suas experiências e pesquisas a respeito do tema transição energética. Gostaria de agradecer as seguintes pessoas que viabilizaram esse encontro e essa visita. Primeiro, a Maria Koenig, que é cônsul geral da Alemanha no Recife, minha cidade natal, a Christian Zegnitz, a Dida Econômico da Embaixada da Alemanha no Brasil, a professor Márcio e sua equipe, a Carmen Langner, Bernardo Deur e Arthur Schutter, da GEISA em Brasília, e, por fim, a André Peptoni, diretor-geral, a Angélica Pertilli, assessora internacional da ANEL e sua equipe, e a Amanda Damasceno, também da assessoria da diretoria. Os professores Matias Lang e Christian Pilov possuem larga experiência em direito da regulação e em direito da energia elétrica. E representam aqui o espírito de Otto Maia, o pai ou avô do direito administrativo econômico. O professor Matias Lang foi meu professor em Berlim. Como vocês podem ver, além da competência, tem uma veia humorística. O professor Pilov me recebeu de forma muito gentil no IBE, que é o Instituto de Direito Mineral e de Energia da Universidade de Bochum, e também sempre muito gentil, e eu agradeço afetuosamente a sua visita. São muito, gran muito grandes os desafios, os riscos e op as oportunidades para o setor elétrico brasileiro nesse momento. Nesse, nessa semana estamos vivendo isso. Dr. Pilov, Dr. Matias Lang, essa semana estamos vivendo 
uma audiência pública e está sendo discutida uma resolução extremamente importante para a vida do brasileiro. Nós podemos observar os acertos e os desacertos das políticas adotadas na Alemanha e nós aproveitar delas como ensinamentos. Como falei ontem, numa reunião reservada, nós precisamos, antes de transpor essas experiências, considerar as diferenças entre os países. O território brasileiro é 24 vezes maior do que o alemão. Então, aqui não existe o fenômeno do not in my backyard. Existe, sim, o please in my backyard. O exato oposto. O Brasil população, possui população quase três vezes superior à da Alemanha. Somos 210 milhões de brasileiros, mais um, ou talvez mais dois, porque o professor Matias Lang já veio duas vezes ao Brasil esse ano e já preenche os requisitos para a nacionalidade brasileira. E, claro, por gentileza, vamos estender essa nacionalidade ao professor Pilov também. Porém, nós ocupamos ainda a 79ª posição no IDH. A Alemanha está na quinta posição. A Alemanha é a quarta maior economia mundial. O Brasil já foi a sétima, atualmente é a oitava. Porém, o Brasil é pentacampeão mundial de futebol e a Alemanha apenas tetra, e só porque nós ajudamos. O professor Lang falou que os alemães eles não se importam muito com os custos e querem o bem da humanidade. Nós nos importamos com os custos, mas queremos também o bem da humanidade. Então, poderíamos nos unir e já estamos preparando algumas contas para que os senhores levem para a Alemanha para ver se a população vai assumir. Porque aquele valor de 26 bilhões de euros por ano, se passarmos uns 20 bilhões de reais, que dá, dá uns 4 bilhões de euros para os alemães, não será nada demais. Admiramos muito a experiência da Alemanha, entendemos que é uma política consistente de 30 anos ou mais de incentivo às energias renováveis, erros foram cometidos, houve uma verdadeira gold rush, uma caça ao tesouro, algo parecido também já houve no Brasil, e as metas foram ultrapassadas em muito, representando um peso para o consumidor alemão. Nós estamos atentos a todos esses passos, Por fim, nós lamentamos que vocês sejam vizinhos da França nuclear e da Polônia cavoeira. Mas tenham sempre na lembrança que nós somos vizinhos, apenas nós somos vizinhos dos argentinos, que são nossos adversários no futebol. Então, com essas palavras, eu passo a palavra, antes de estender, de passar a palavra para as perguntas da plateia, eu passo a palavra ao meu amigo Mila Cairo, que está representando aqui também o professor Maciório. Muito obrigado, Luiz Eduardo Diniz, procurador-geral da ANEL. É, em nome de quem também cumprimento os demais presentes, é, servidores, é, advogados, e também cumprimento na mesma oportunidade os professores Christian Pillow e Matias Lang, que nos brindaram com a excelente exposição a respeito de como podemos contribuir é, do ponto de vista da academia para a compreensão da regulação e também para a adoção de melhores práticas que aliem diferentes interesses, às vezes contrapostos, mas que ao final do dia precisam ser compostos para que as coisas, a vida, siga como deve seguir. Então tendo isso em mente e agradecendo mais uma vez a oportunidade de poder falar em nome do Grupo de Estudos em Direito de Energia Elétrica da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília e também aqui em Lechato, representando o professor Márcio Iório, também na companhia da coordenadora executiva Juliana Vilas Boas, já iniciar, Luiz Eduardo, uma, com uma pergunta. Tendo em vista 
é, especialmente a diferença, inclusive, é, o Luiz Eduardo já comentou que tivemos uma reunião reservada ontem, que pudemos já ter um, um panorama geral da apresentação. Muito se percebeu dessa exposição, e aí o olhar do, do acadêmico, daquele que se dedica a também a, a sair um pouco do seu foco de análise e tentar ter uma visão mais ampla, conseguir perceber semelhanças, obviamente também de semelhanças, mas que do ponto de vista é, da análise consiga trazer expectativas ou até soluções. Nesse, e também críticas que são muito importantes. Nesse ponto de vista, observamos na apresentação é, do professor, principalmente o professor Matias Lang, que deu o um enfoque da Alemanha, que do ponto de vista de transição energética, a Alemanha vive uma situação de substituição de fonte. No Brasil, também se fala em transição energética, mas de outro lado, numa perspectiva de expansão da nossa matriz. Contudo, tanto lá quanto aqui, estamos enfrentando um grave problema de intermitência de fontes. O que é interessante, ainda que por motivos diversos, porque as técnicas regulatórias precisarão alcançar essa situação. Aqui no Brasil, inclusive discutimos ontem no grupo de estudos, há algumas técnicas é, regulatórias já sendo colocadas em práticas, como a adoção do preço horário, é, que foi abordada pelo professor Fernando Colli, também servidor da ANEL, servidor da casa. É, então, muito interessante, discutimos aqui internamente, o professor Lang falou bastante sobre é, mercado de capacidade, que é um dos temas da consulta pública 33, que está sendo analisada pelo grupo de trabalho do Ministério de Minas e Energia, é, que ainda não é algo a ser adotado imediatamente na Alemanha, mas, de fato, aqui no Brasil já se discute. Mas, saindo um pouco dessa visão mais ampla e tentando focar no tema do seminário, que é mini microgeração de energia, muito é, me chamou a atenção o fato de que a Alemanha enfrentou, e ainda está enfrentando em alguma medida, porque a regulação é dinâmica, é, críticas e embates que hoje estamos enfrentando. Amanhã enfrentaremos em uma consulta pública é, sobre o tema. E é justamente sobre esse, esse tema que eu gostaria de perguntar. De fato, existe, tal como o senhor colocou, o professor Matias Lang, em um dos slides, uma tensão entre aqueles que hoje em dia se assumem como prosumers, se assumem como geradores da própria energia, e, de outro lado, como custear isso do ponto de vista sistêmico, principalmente visando equidade social, tendo em vista que a transição energética também precisa ser justa. Nesse ponto de vista, queria entender como foi para a Alemanha, nos seus diversos aspectos, tanto de mercado, quanto legislativo, quanto do próprio executivo, a adoção de técnicas regulatórias que conseguiram, de alguma forma, adaptar a regulação é, existente, exante, para uma regulação que teve essa transição para, de alguma forma, tornar a geração da mini microgeração distribuída mais equitativa. Como foi isso para vocês? E se existem críticas do ponto de vista da academia ou do, do próprio mercado de como foi feito lá na Alemanha? Muito obrigado. Yes, uh, yeah, happy to start. Thank you. Um, how how did we how did we do it? I mean, as a as a practical matter, uh, the ministry has many bright people working in the in the ministry, be that the environmental ministry or the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. Um, and to put some additional perspective in there, they hire consultants as well to work on reports. They ask. Uh, economic consultants, they ask uh, university professors, you know, law firms to, uh, for their inputs. There is a, a fairly big scene these days of, of, of people who advise the government on that. Then the lobby groups uh, also have very strong and very intelligent people uh, thinking about how to do that as well. Uh, so there's a multitude of, of, of documents usually prepared in connection with the changes. Uh, the, I think the political process varies. Uh, uh, I mean, when, when we look at the support regime part, technically, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's happening on the legislative 
level in Germany. So it's not the, 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 the tariffs as such are not set by, by the Federal Network Agency, not the regulator, but by uh, parliamentary acts and the implementation of details, for example, collecting the data, applying the rules and the law to the feed-in tariff is done by then the Federal Network Agency. So, so I think we have this input from uh, the, 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 you know, the, the government side plus external advisors that go, gets fed into the parliamentary system. There is more or less clear what drives uh, the decisions. I mean, we had a, have a very stable, stable government um, uh, for many years, and something I slide I did not include, but I think something uh, uh, good to keep in mind, why is Germany so strong on the renewable development? Basically, everybody who has anything to say in German government was an environmental minister at some stage. Uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel actually started off as a young environmental minister uh, going to the Rio conference. Uh, so, uh, and basically everyone else, Altmaier, the current minister of energy and environmental affairs, uh, is a former environment minister. Gabriel, the one beforehand, also started off as environment minister. So Barke was, uh, was the state secretary dealing with it. So basically everyone who has anything to say uh, is an environmental minister. Uh, so. Once you then make it up the ranks in the in the government, uh, you you also sort of you remember what you the papers you signed off on earlier. But that, that's a bit b beside the part. So th there's there's lots of people also on the political government side who have a history of, of working on that and who sort of the the, the general aim of of. In, uh, increasing the amount of renewable energy in the system and, and different from, from you, we, we just replace coal and something and unfortunately we don't have the big hydro systems uh, so that this is clearly different. Um, this, is, this is a key driver in, in, in the development of the process. Yeah, uh, I could uh, <laughs> totally write what uh, said uh, Dr. Lang, but you, you ask also if, um, if I uh, understood you well uh, uh, along the uh, equality of, of burden no? uh, between uh, the, the so-called haves and the no-haves. So one have the, the, the P PV uh, um, s cells on, on the, the roofs and the houses and, and the other who do, uh, do not have the um, uh, CV uh, panels um, have to pay for. This is, this is indeed um, a an, an subject of, of not only political, but also legal uh, <coughs> debate in, in, in Germany uh, to such extent, uh, for instance, uh, that there is a, a broad uh, discussion about uh, sharing the zones or regions of, of uh, electricity pricing. Um, you have uh, regions uh, in Germany where we have a lot, lot of wind power, a lot of uh, solar uh, power, uh, and they have uh, other, other structures uh, um, uh, concerning uh, net costs and, and uh, um, uh, net network <coughs> extension costs and, and so far uh, in order to, to balance this, uh, um, this, this uh, inequality uh, between the uh, burden burdens for, for the energy transition uh, that could be one of, of uh, the solution. Um, the, the European law also uh, uh, um, uh, has uh, so, so produces uh, such, a, such an in instrument. Another problem in Germany is uh, 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 constitutionally speaking, um, the, constitu uh, the, the constitution, German uh, fundamental law, requires uh, more or less same ele electricity prices for all Germans. For, for all the, uh, uh, and so far, it would be very um, uh, difficult against the background of the constitutional law to build up uh, different zones of, of, of different uh, electricity prices. Muito obrigado. Antes de passar a palavra à plateia, eu gostaria de cumprimentar o diretor Rodrigo Limpe, que é o relator da revisão da resolução 482, que não está tendo uma semana fácil. É, muito obrigado pela presença, doutor Rodrigo, que se encontra ali. E passo a palavra para as perguntas da plateia. Quem quiser fazer alguma pergunta, por favor, se levantar a mão, que o microfone chegará até você. Olá. Olá. É, bom, achei muito boa a apresentação. Muito interessante o modelo alemão... Da, do deságio da, do valor da energia em relação a, ao deságio do valor das placas. Não, não tinha, nunca tinha pensado nisso. É, mas a, a minha pergunta, acho que vai mais para o professor Matias Lang, é, 
em relação porque todos aqueles gráficos da, da dos tipos de geração de energia ao longo da semana tudo isso a gente chega né conclui na demanda a potência da demanda num certo momento é, a gente a gente está falando sempre de energia nos slides mas acaba que é naquele momento quanto de energia qual a potência que um consumidor precisa qual a potência que está sendo gerada é, então voltando um pouco antes o, a Alemanha incentivou bastante a geração de energia distribuída descentralizada porque na época desenvolveu bastante a, a, a indústria da parte de energia solar e várias empresas com bastante tecnologia tu, tudo mais hoje ela está incentivando essa questão da bateria né? então eu vejo muitas muita tecnologia sendo produzida na Alemanha em relação ao uso de baterias para você injetar cada vez menos energia na rede e aí a minha pergunta é em relação aos valores de demanda, é, demanda contratada, demanda cobrada, né, que é a potência instantânea. Como funciona essa precificação e, e o que tem sido feito é, para beneficiar aquele cliente que reduz essa demanda por uso de baterias ou realmente ou se desligando em algum momento? currently do not get uh, money for that, which is part of the challenge uh, at the moment. So uh, getting the pricing right now for battery systems is one of the things that we are still thinking about, and you need to look at the different levels. I mean, you have batteries. I think what you mentioned is basically residential uh, batteries. Uh, people do that. Um, there are some systems out there. Uh, interestingly, some analysis at the moment says that people who put batteries in residential houses do not necessarily do this just for the price uh, of it, necessarily to make money with it. They just want it, and actually often they take, the batteries are too big, you could do it cheaper, they, 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 they want to do that. It's very interesting uh, uh, to understand battery consumers for households, uh, which do not necessarily work on a purely economic basis. Um, So, so there, I think, at the moment, what we're trying to do is let, try to let the market work out. Uh, it's very difficult to put a really good price tag to that, because how do you price it? If you have peak generation, I mean, we have, as you know, peak consumption in winter, uh, and have the part there, and in summer, how much do you do that with the, uh, the batteries uh, on residential houses? So it's very small. To, to have the negative prices in there. So the, 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 the actual amount of money that you're really talking about there is, is small. I think what we're more trying to do is see how we, I mean, what you have is one, the smart metering part, uh, demand side management, how that is going to happen. And you mentioned that from the European side, who's encouraging it. On the battery side, we are, well, we have batteries on the primary reserve part and the network systems, uh, some systems out there very um, quick quick reaction times and we are currently I'm currently working on on bigger scale uh, uh, battery power storage systems but that's still technology being deployed and we there we are wondering how to do that because commercially as it currently works if you deploy major battery systems basically by the day you deploy it it's outdated and someone who deploys the battery a year later can do that cheaper and basically kills the price for the people who have deployed it a year earlier. We do not have a feed-in tariff version system that you have a guaranteed price uh, for your battery storage that you can plan for the expected lifetime of the battery system, how to do that. We currently don't have that, partly perhaps because we spend so much money uh, already on the renewables that we think there we might now want to save some money. Uh, but it, but it's, a, it's a regulatory question. If you have a good solution from Brazil, I think we'd be very happy to take it back to Germany with us. <laughs> okay. Uh, muito obrigado. Mais alguma pergunta da plateia? Tem uma pergunta.
Bom, boa tarde a todos. Eu sou o Rangel, aqui me identificando como empresário e hoje aluno de engenharia da, da UNB. É, enfim, sou graduado na área de relações internacionais e há, há uns 15 anos atrás, quando me formei, eu fiz uma monografia sobre MDL, Mercado é, Mecanismo de Desenvolvimento Limpos. Né? E aí hoje eu tenho acompanhado uma, uma discussão acerca da precificação do carbono. Na Alemanha, durante esse período, foi feito algum levantamento, algum, alguma comparação entre o impacto é, que os sistemas fotovoltaicos causariam ou deixariam de impactar na atmosfera? Isso foi precificado e retornou, de certa forma, ao, ao, a quem instalou? Houve esse tipo de experiência por lá? a very interesting but also very political question <laughs> pricing of uh, CO2 uh, of, of uh, carbon uh, uh, emissions I can uh, say you that uh, uh, in particular and uh, especially in these days last weeks uh, two three months uh, this is one of the biggest uh, issues of uh, policy debates in Germany Uh, until uh, until now, uh, not uh, res resolved at, at all. But, but uh, there is, there is uh, the, 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 the main uh, problem that instead of all what we are discussing here, instead of uh, promoting uh, renewables uh, um, since many uh, years, uh, the emissions of uh, the CO2 emissions of Germany are increasing. Are continuously increasing. Uh, the, the main reason is uh, that uh, that the, the emissions are produced uh, mainly in the uh, house heating and in the transport uh, sector uh, rather than in the uh, electricity sector. Uh, and so far, uh, you ha you have the, uh, the the problem on the one hand uh, renewables, uh, but on the other hand, uh, other hand uh, uh, still and continuously inc increasing. Uh, emissions and uh, before that background uh, policy uh, policy debate takes place in order to introduce or um, a tax on on CO2, uh, CO2 uh, emissions or it's an other other uh, option other yeah uh, other option uh, to implement a system Uh, of uh, emission trading scheme only on the national level. You know that there is an emission trading scheme on the European uh, level, but uh, an, an option could be to introduce uh, such a scheme um, on the national uh, levi level, and uh, the third uh, option would be uh, simply to, to increase uh, taxes, uh, energy taxes. Uh, or a combination of th these uh, fr uh, three options. Uh, and now uh, we are facing, uh, b but uh, uh, I didn't read it through uh, uh, before my before our trip to, to Brazil, we are facing new legislative uh, draft uh, uh, bill of, of the uh, federal legislator in order to, to, to make a, yeah, uh, uh, um, how do you, how would we, uh, Klimaschutzgesetz, law, uh, law against uh, uh, the risk of uh, climate uh, change, with all these me measures included. Uh, yeah, well, your question is wonderful. There is one thing with all the figures that we have on renewable energy, the CDM, the other, that, that part, we, there is no official figure in Germany, there's no data on saying how do we actually save a ton of CO2 in the most cost efficient way. Uh, on the EEG side, at some stage we decided to do that for political reasons. And the cost of CO2 abatement using the EEG is actually very high. Uh, uh, it's one of the non-figures of German energy policy, uh, which, and I don't know if I had that when I was teaching in Berlin, it's one of the figures I always use. I ask people, sort of, what do you think, how much do we actually spend per ton of CO2 using the EEG? That figure is not officially available from the government, but we have so, many, so much data. It's probably in the range of 200 euros per ton of CO2, Uh, for 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 reductions, and when you balance that on the current uh, price for uh, EU ETS emissions trading, even at a higher price now, it used to be six, seven, eight, nine uh, euros per, per per kilowatt, or then fifteen, twenty, it's still a lot cheaper to do that. And the uh, the CDMs, the mechanisms on the emissions trading, uh, are a way to probably commercially to do it in a in a very reasonable way. 
Um, it's something that is not so much uh, discussed. It's one of the things uh, that you hardly find any data on. So it's an excellent question. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Aqui a pergunta de Fernando Colli. Fernando Colli é especialista em regulação na, aqui na ANEL e esteve ontem proferindo palestra exatamente no nosso grupo aqui de estudos da UNB. Bom, é, obrigado pela palestra. Eu gostaria de fazer duas perguntas, uma para o professor Christian e outra para o Mat Matias, mas também eles podem trocar, depender. É, teve um slide do professor Christian que ele mostrou o sistema elétrico europeu, uma forte interligação uh, da parte continental com o Reino Unido. Como que vai ficar agora o mercado com a saída do Reino Unido da União Europeia? E essas interligações vão ficar vazia ou vai haver transporte, vai haver um pagamento, vai ser um mercado à parte, ou não se sabe ainda o que vai ser? Aí, a segunda pergunta... A segunda pergunta, professor Matias, é, o senhor mencionou que é, energia hidrelétrica não é algo mais que a Alemanha deseja, por, por mudar a paisagem de maneira geral. Isso é porque o potencial hidrelétrico já está esgotado, vocês já exploraram o que tinha a explorar, porque vai ter muita mudança social, deslocamento de pessoas, coisas do tipo ou porque é mais caro que outros renováveis como solar e eólica ou as três juntos ou nenhuma das três opções obrigado okay. thank you very much f f first f first uh, question um, how, how to, to, to follow up uh, with the UK when the Brexit uh, when the Brexit came uh, depends from the Brexit uh, how, how we will uh, realize it? Uh, you, know, you know that uh, uh, the, that are uh, treaties uh, in in, uh, uh, in the table among the UK and the, and the European Union um, concerning concerning a so-called regulated uh, uh, or regular uh, Brexit, and there, there's the other option of the wild uh, Brexit without any any treaty. And in, in a treaty, of course, you. You, you can you can regulate uh, uh, the consequences uh, of an exit of, of, of the UK f from the Euro Union also uh, in the field of uh, energy supply and uh, energy uh, grid uh, connections. But on the other hand, I would say you don't worry about the Brexit in the field of energy uh, because uh, the UK is more or less indep uh, independent. Uh, in the uh, what what concerns uh, the electricity uh, uh, sector, of course there are connections, grid connections, uh, high tension grid connections um, between the UK and and the, the continent. Uh, but uh, when when the when when the UK uh, leaves, the continent uh, continent will not uh, um, uh, will not need uh, any electricity for from uh, Great Britain, <laughs> and uh, also uh, 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 neither neither in the other sense. No? The uh, they have their gas, they have their nuclear power, they have also uh, huge uh, plants, new plants of, of uh, offshore uh, wind in the North uh, Sea, uh, but they are uh, more or less uh, independent uh, from, from the other, from the co continental uh, system of electricity. Is this an answer to your question? Maybe just one, one small addition to that. Uh, I think an area where there is a potentially bigger problem is in Ireland between Northern Ireland uh, and the main uh, island. Um, there are some agreements on that uh, in the back, but, but Ireland is really critical. Um, and technically, I, I think something to keep in mind is that Europe has always, on the energy side, been quite good in having contracts outside of the European Union, uh, much to the displeasure at the moment uh, of Mr. Trump, uh, also that we take a lot of uh, power from elsewhere, it's not electricity, but, but gas. Um, but to your question on hydro, it's not really that we do not want hydro. It Unfortunately, to some degree, it has not developed further. And um, the reason being uh, that not that the there's no potential. The, 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 the potential is limited uh, because of the way sort of the German landscape works uh, and the number of people really living there. So displacing many people is not an option. There are a couple of areas where it is. it would be possible to do it. Um, they are, however, in beautiful landscapes. Uh, 
and uh, people don't like the idea too much to add a nice lake uh, up on a hill somewhere and have another la new lake somewhere down the hill, uh, even though it probably would look nice, uh, the people get very unhappy about people doing these sort of things. This is the type of infrastructure project that is very difficult, if not impossible, to do uh, for for reasons of objection from from the from the population. And quite interesting to see that, because you put all these big wind turbines uh, everywhere, and it's not that they are invisible. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that that's one thing. The other part on the hydro uh, side is that commercially to make a hydro plant viable is another one. I mean, we have a couple of hydro plants. Uh, the the um, pumped hydro is the one that could use ideally for, for balancing the grid, but commercially, historically works if you have uh, sufficient delta uh, during the day because it's basically short term. Commercially, they work historically because the, the amount of water they have, uh, they, they work on short term uh, arbitrage. Uh, but the when we used to have a price peak over lunch, uh, but the PV system have taken away the price peak, so it sort of now looks like this. And over the day, it has l led to flattening, and that means that the, the, the delta is smaller, which commercially makes it less attractive to do that. You could do that by supporting that because you want to use that as a system service, but it's again, a, that is a commercial question. So the answer to not having more hydro is a mix of the two things, uh, or three uh, elements that you have. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, we, we do not have huge dams uh, that we can use. There is some discussion um, of, well, why, if we don't do it in Germany, why don't we do it in Norway? Um, uh, and uh, <laughs> build something there, or let's do it in Austria um, or Switzerland. Um, however, when you then go out to Norway, Austria, and Switzerland and ask them whether they want to be the big water hydro battery for Germany, there is less little, little uh, excitement to do that in a great scale uh, because it's uh, the, 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 the in, in, in Switzerland there's objection to build new ones. You need to build the new lines. And again, it's a pricing question. Uh, how you do that. So, um, uh, and in, in Norway, I, I participated in a, in a conference on that. So, yes, people are thinking about it. Yes, it's something we're doing. Yes, we're actually building some interconnectors that would facilitate that. There is something there, but it's a question of how much we can actually do. Just uh, one remark uh, to, to the second uh, question. Uh, there's also uh, an obstacle as, as to new um, uh, pump, uh, pump storage, uh, uh, hydro power pl uh, plants uh, from the uh, environmental law, and again uh, from the so-called NIMBYs, not in my backyard. You are not able to to to, to build up uh, any uh, new uh, power plant. You, 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 you need uh, lakes uh, uh, in the in the German landscape uh, inter alia because uh, we have a, a very dense population, as you know, uh, <laughs> much, much more than, than in Brazil, and, and impossible. We, we had a uh, research project in our institute about the possibility to build up uh, pump storage power plants uh, underground. Uh, in the, uh, I told you of, of the uh, uh, closing of uh, hard coal mines in our region, and uh, theoretically, technically, you could use this, this mines in order to let uh, uh, the water uh, in. You have a, a, a turbine on the, on the ground and, and then uh, a pump as a power station. But uh, this, this uh, also would, uh, would ra rarely be uh, economic <laughs> economically uh, feasible. You have to pay for this. this is trem <laughs> tremendous costs. Muito obrigado, Professor Pilo, Professor Lang. Mais alguma pergunta? da plateia. Bem, como não há mais perguntas e já estamos nos aproximando do final, eu passo a palavra a Miller primeiro, depois ao professor Pilov, depois ao professor Lang para considerações finais. Muito obrigado, Luiz Eduardo Diniz. As considerações serão bem breves, é, mais no sentido de agradecimento pela oportunidade de poder representar a Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília, especialmente o Núcleo de Estudos e o Grupo de Estudos. 
é, em direito de energia elétrica e dizer que, de fato, todos os temas aqui debatidos serão também analisados em outras atividades do grupo de estudos, é, mostrando o tanto que a interface da academia, do mercado, da agência, do ministério, é relevante. Essa interface, essa conexão, essa troca de conhecimento que se mostra aberta ao diálogo, à crítica e, neste ato aqui, também há uma visão mais ampla, buscando soluções onde quer que estejam, seja na Alemanha, seja na União Europeia, para que problemas reais sejam resolvidos. Portanto, agradecendo mais uma vez, em nome do professor Márcio Iorio, é, gostaria de falar aos professores é, Matias Lang e Christian Pilo que a Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Brasília fica aberta à cooperação internacional e, com certeza, teremos novos, é, novas atividades, novos encontros, é, que serão possibilitados com o desenvolvimento dessa parceria. E agradeço mais uma vez a oportunidade fornecida pelo, pelo Procurador-Geral Luiz Eduardo Diniz, também agradeço ao Diretor-Geral André, Dr. Edu, é, André Pepitone e também ao Diretor Rodrigo Limpe. Obrigado. Professor Pilov, final considerations? Final considerations. Uh, th thank you very much again for, for, for your invitation. I'm very glad uh, to, to hear uh, with you and, and to uh, I, I'm also, in, in, in so far I can say, say, same to you both. Uh, um, we, we also are very interested in uh, following up uh, our dialogue. We cannot resolve uh, all our detailed uh, problems in only one uh, afternoon. We should follow up uh, um, continuous uh, dialogue. And let me say that, that we, we have uh, uh, in our heads already the idea to, to start up uh, perhaps a, a form of, of summer school, uh, international summer school in Germany with participants, participants from uh, abroad, uh, experts from other countries who are uh, interested uh, in the exchange of uh, knowledges technically, economically, legally, uh, and uh, that could be a path uh, in order to develop uh, and continuous uh, dialogue. Uh, and uh, other uh, last, uh, last remark, uh, Luis Arojo uh, uh, um, uh, mentioned the other differences between um, Brazil and, and Germany, inter alia the low temperatures uh, in our region at the moment. Uh, I'm not too interested to, to have to go back already uh, tomorrow uh, with only six uh, degrees in uh, our region. But you forgot uh, to, 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 to mention one, uh, um, one very important uh, and further important uh, detail. This is a very uh, exquisite, uh, exquisite cuisine and kitchen that we have in Brazil and that, uh, that we are f uh, failing in Germany. I, I enjoyed yesterday a very good bacalao <laughs> and and a good, uh, a very good Brazi for the first time. I, I took a very good uh, Brazilian uh, uh, white wine. Uh, for that reasons, I would uh, would be interested uh, for at least uh, a second citizenship in in Brazil. Muito uh, obrigado. Thank you very much, Professor Pilo, uh, Professor Lang. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, also uh, from me. I think the interesting part when you have these conversations is that the, the laws of physics are the same. Electricity does what it does, uh, and there are certain rules that you cannot change. Neither the lawyers can change the, what, what, the, what the power does, nor the politicians can do that. Uh, there's, uh, and, but, and, and therefore, you have certain challenges that are basically driven by physics and you need to find certain solutions. You have different situations in countries, different approaches. Uh, uh, Brazil is a wonderful country with your hydropower, makes it a lot uh, easier for you with your wonderful country to, to do certain things, uh, and, uh, um, and you don't have to do all the things, strange things that we have tried out, but I think uh, what also the, the discussion 
today brought that uh, we've tried some, some solutions. Uh, not all of them work. We're still experimenting. We're spending a lot of money on it. Uh, that kind of money is gone anyway, uh, but you can benefit from it fairly cheaply. Uh, uh, now by looking at it and say, yeah, that wasn't interesting, it didn't work, but this is what we make of it, uh, and then do that uh, for your system. I, I personally always very much enjoy the exchange on the ideas uh, and having an excuse to come to Brasilia for the second time this year was just wonderful. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for making it nice and warm. Uh, Lufthansa is maybe working on keeping us here a little longer because they may be going on strike uh, tomorrow. Uh, so, so maybe we can extend the stay, but, uh, which creates another problem. But, but it's, there are far worse places to get stuck in than uh, Brasilia or Brazil. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. E antes de, de finalizar, eh, gostaria de de agradecer profundamente, eu estou emocionado com esse encontro. Desde 2002, eu não tinha um, um ano, um, um dia tão feliz, profissionalmente falando, porque em 2002 eu fui aprovado no concurso para ser procurador federal, e o Brasil foi campeão também do mundo. É, mas tem uma... uma eu gostaria de faz, falar uma, fazer uma citação aqui, a Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev, o, então... É, não sei se era primeiro-ministro ou presidente da União Soviética, e tem uma frase que é atribuída a ele, e que ele diz que não disse. Ele fala que a culpa foi do tradutor. Ele falou em alemão, quem chega atrasado é punido pela vida. Então, o Brasil não pode se atrasar na implantação dessas novas tecnologias, mas, ao fazê-lo, tem que ter muito cuidado com os custos e com a redistribuição entre os consumidores. Por fim, agradeço imensamente a GIZ, que viabilizou financeiramente esse encontro, com a vinda dos professores Pilov e Lang. Desejo um bom retorno aos professores, ao outono alemão, que levem calor humano e alegria brasileiros para os alemães. Muito obrigado. Vielen Dank.